Coming in at number five, we've got the peace picture. I love this story. Honestly, I had no idea that it came from Korea either. When I worked as a camp counselor, I would tell this on night hikes all the time. And let me tell you, it really scared some campers. There are a few different versions with different main characters and different setup scenarios, but the meat and potatoes all pretty much stay the same. All right, so the legend goes a little something like this. A middle schooler is biking home with his friends and they come to a forest path. Our main character lives through the woods and his pals take a different route home. So the group splits up and the young lad cycles through the trees. As he's going along, something catches his eye. There's a Polaroid picture lying face down at the foot of a tree. He pulls off the path, hops off his bike, and notices that there's a broken bicycle behind the tree. Picking up the photo, he sees a cute girl smiling at the camera, flashing the peace sign. You know the one. He really likes the picture, so he pockets it and heads home. That night, the boy feels an overwhelming urge to look out the window. When he does, he notices a young girl standing in his yard, facing away from him. He calls out to her, but she doesn't react. Feeling strange, he heads downstairs and walks into the yard, but the girl is nowhere to be seen. The next day, he shows his friends the picture and tells them the story of the girl in his yard, but none of them seem to recognize her. They go about their day at school, and then it's time to go home. On the ride home, the boy keeps an eye out for the girl about town, but doesn't see anyone resembling her. He and his friends make it to the woods again and split up. Distracted, the boy pedals his way through the flora and fauna. Suddenly, he catches a glimpse of someone behind a tree and cranes his neck to see if it could be her. Unfortunately, this causes him to lose his focus and crash. He doesn't survive. Weeks later, another kid is wandering through the woods. They see a Polaroid photograph lying in the decomposing leaves. Picking the picture up, they see a really cute girl holding up three fingers. Thinking it's a nice photo, they pocket it and head right along. Creepy, right? There are many variants with car wrecks instead of bike crashes and grown men instead of school children, but the peace sign evolving into a three with another victim stays the same. Coming in at number four, we've got virgin ghosts. It's every frat boy from the 80s worst nightmare, dying a virgin. Apparently this fear crosses cultures too. Known in Korea as the Cho Neo Guishin, they can be found all over the place. Folks say that you might run into a virgin ghost in abandoned buildings, hospitals, schools, bathrooms, cemeteries, and forests. So basically anywhere you might have found a living virgin. They are characterized by their long dark hair that completely covers their face and they're always wearing white clothing. Look behind that hair and you'll notice they look pretty bummed too. I suppose that comes with the title, huh? People say you'll know you're near one when the temperature drops suddenly and the wind changes direction. Chills are a common symptom too, but those kind of come with the previous two. In Confucian Korean culture, it was a woman's role to serve her father, husband, and sons. If someone died before doing these things, she would be cursed to wander the earth forever. So if a woman was to die a virgin, she would become a Cho Nyo Guishin. This comes with a fair deal of bitterness. Often, these ghosts will wander around the place where their former family lived, doing their best to cause problems for their good old relatives. Apparently erecting, pardon the pun, phallic statues could calm an angry virgin ghost down. This doesn't work, or if town council won't approve a long hard statue, you can always try to introduce the ghost to an equally single male. The male virgin ghost, or the Chong Gak Guishin, is always looking for someone to marry to put their soul to rest. So if you find one virgin ghost, you'd best get to work finding another. Number three on this list is Sawyer Castle. Sawyer Castle is currently haunted by the ghosts of two lovers who left this world far too soon. Ranker says, this haunted Kansas mansion has many gruesome tales attached to it, but certainly the most awful one involves the tragic suicides committed by a husband and wife during the Civil War. The owner of the house had gone to fight and instructed his wife to wait for the arrival of a particular ferry that he would be coming home on. When her husband did not return on that ferry, she assumed him dead and hung herself in the bell tower. However, he was in fact still alive, and upon his arriving home, he found his wife dead and killed himself out of misery. It's said that strange lights and noises emanate from the house's bell tower to this day. This story is very similar to that of a classic play, Romeo and Juliet. Two lovers held apart by something out of their control take their own life in what is a clear miscommunication. Even though this was horrible, I suppose that they sort of got what they wanted. Now they're together forever, but just in ghost form. Of course, they can't just let this lie though and have to haunt this place and ruin everyone else's life who's still living here. Maybe they think that because they're still together and technically still around, that they should own the home and anyone in it that's not them is a trespasser. Whatever it is that they think, they make it very difficult for those who go around here. I'd avoid this place altogether if I was you. Number two on this list is Fort Leavenworth. 
What happened here back in the day is enough to make anyone's hair raise. Ranker says Fort Leavenworth is considered to be one of the most haunted army bases in the US and it's home to a number of helpful and malignant spirits. It has seen centuries of war and is home to a military prison called the United States Disciplinary Barracks. During World War II, there was a prisoner uprising and as punishment for their unruliness, one prisoner was hung every hour for 14 hours. They quickly ran out of space in the gallows and also used one of the elevator shafts in the administration building to hang people. Ever since then, screams have been heard from that same elevator shaft at odd hours. Not surprisingly, nearly every building on the base has a horrifying story attached to it. I know that it was war and they were trying to have an uprising, but my gosh, hanging one person an hour? Like, that is just so brutal. No wonder this place is deeply haunted now. All of the spirits from back then are locked into this place and refuse to let go. And you better believe that they make the people who are still around pay for what happened in the past. People have reportedly been attacked by invisible spirits before. They've been clawed at and bitten and one person even had their finger ripped right off of their body. Things are not pleasant at this army base and I'm kind of surprised that it hasn't been raised to the ground yet. Might be the only thing left to do to quiet these spirits down. And finally, Finally, number one on this list is the ghost of Saline River. You already know that this is going to be a scary legend when they have a name like that. Ranker says, according to legend, a Native American ghost by the name of Takaluma is said to walk the banks of the Saline River and was first spotted by a cowboy in the winter of 1879. Takaluma's spirit was condemned to wander the river until he found the skull of his dead father, who had been murdered by white men in the 1840s. The ghost rose from his burial mound and warned that far more powerful spirits might might join in the search, but the skull has still never been found. What a horrible fate. Your father gets murdered and then you have to spend the rest of your existence as a ghost wandering around this river searching for his skull. This ghost was once a calm presence, but time has made Takaluma angry. Now it's said that this ghost will drag unsuspecting victims into the river and drown them, then take their skull and see if he can convince the other spirits that it's his father's. This has never worked before, but when you have a literal eternity, I suppose suppose you'll try anything. A beautiful river to look at from a distance, but not one that you want to get too close to. Coming in at 5, Arlington Screaming Bridge. Now this Texas legend will quite honestly make your hair stand on end. Legend has it that one full night more than 50 years ago, several teens were carpooling home after their high school football game. Still riled up over the victory, driving responsibly definitely wasn't of utmost importance to the young teens. The bridge running through Arlington's River Legacy Park was just wide enough for one car at a time. You can probably guess where this is going. The teens hooting and hollering drowned out all the noise, like that of a vehicle that had no working headlights. The cars collided head on before erupting in a fiery explosion and plunging into the waters below. Nobody survived. The bridge is now closed to vehicular traffic with the site only accessed on foot. However, it now has a new name gifted to it by locals, Screaming Bridge. A name which was coined after the first brave souls when exploring along the bridge and experienced events that can only only be explained by the supernatural. Legend has it, if you stand on the bridge and gaze into the river below, you'll see a tombstone for each of the deceased with their names, date of birth and death. Visit at midnight on the anniversary and you'll hear two cars screeching towards each other before colliding. Coming in at 4, the nurse at Bexar County Hospital. If you ever find yourself in Texas, whatever you do, do not find yourself at the dilapidated Bexar County Hospital because it is supposedly housing the spirit based on an American serial killer called Janine Jones. Now the real life killer is responsible for the deaths of up to 60 infants and children in her care as a licensed vocational nurse during the 1970s and 1980s. In 1994, she was convicted of murder and was sentenced to 99 years in prison with triple credit. Now, the legend of the nurse at Bexar County Hospital a similar treading, with legend stating that a murderous spirit used to wander the halls killing patients in order of their room number, first 201, then 202, 203, 204. It began in one ward where patients all began asking about one particular nurse. However, when the staff checked the security camera, they found the patient speaking to seemingly no one. They saw the curtains close on their own. Tracheotomy tubes get pulled out by an unseen force, but then, very quickly, the patients began dying in their room number order. Like I said, many Bexar County locals believe the legend to be based off of Janine Jones, but what do you guys think?
Coming in at number three, we've got Dreaming of Dead Family. You would think that seeing a dead family member might be nice. You know, maybe they're here to give you some advice or warn you of impending danger, or maybe they're just showing up because they miss you. Aww. However, there's a South Korean urban legend that says dreaming of a dead loved one is bad news. Do your best to resist their lovely charm, all right? It's said that if you dream of a dead family member or friend, they're going to try and steal your soul. They'll call you towards them, and if you head on down and give them a hug, it's game over. This is especially common near water, apparently. If these dreams persist, it's best to look into why they're happening. It's likely that whoever's calling out to you thinks that you owe them something or you're holding on to one of their belongings. To figure out for sure, people advise heading out to wherever they're buried to pay respects. That should take care of the potentially soul-stealing dreams, and if not, well, I don't know what to tell you. Keep avoiding hugs, I guess. Coming in at number two, we've got dog-human hybrids. Stories of people hearing disembodied voices while walking alone have been around pretty much forever, but this particular legend explains the mysterious phenomenon in a pretty creepy way. Around the 1970s, all sorts of folks started telling tall tales of finding truly disturbing creatures late at night. While strolling along, they hear a voice. They look up, they look down, they look left, they look right, and nobody's around, so they resume walking. But the voice calls out again. It's talking to them. A little paranoid now, the person checks behind them and looks to see if anyone is leaning out of a window or something. No dice. Then a little dog runs up to them. Oh, what a cute little dog they think. But then it speaks using language. And the person gets a good look at the four-legged creature and oh god, it's got a human face. Anyone with unsoiled trousers at that point is a champion. These chimeric abominations are apparently quite common in Japanese and Korean folklore. It's said that someone who lives a sinful life will end up reincarnated as a half-dog, half-human monstrosity. Like, it would be cool to live the carefree life of a dog, but definitely not with a human head and intelligence. But considering my sinful modern lifestyle, I'm destined to become a dog man. What's a good name for one of those? And finally at number one, we've got sesame seeds. I know what you're thinking. Keegan, you must be losing it. Sesame seeds aren't an urban legend. They're an edible plant byproduct, delicious on bagels and breads. Ah, but you see, I know sesame seeds are real. But there are plenty of legends concerning them in Korea. Remember when I warned all the tripophobes to skedaddle? Well, this is why. There are a few different stories about the ill effects of sesame seeds. One concerns a young woman taking a rejuvenating sesame seed bath. She learns of a lovely new skin treatment where you pour sesame seeds into your bath water. Supposedly this does wonders, leaving you extra youthful and glowing with super clean pores. So the woman decides to give it a try. She fills the tub, tosses in the seeds, and steps into the bath. Her mother, knowing how excited her daughter was to try this treatment, begins to worry after she doesn't come out of the bathroom for an hour. She knocks on the door, but gets no answer. Fearing the worst, the mother forces the door open and stumbles in. Her daughter's unconscious in the tub with sesame seeds stuck on all of her grotesquely open pores. The seeds have taken root in her skin. Oh, yuck. The alternate telling of this tale involves sesame seed skin cream with similar terrifying results. I suppose the pimple popping crowd might find this fascinating, but for most folks, this is hideously upsetting. Usually the victim in this sesame seed disaster is able to have all the seeds removed, but it is a time consuming and painful process. However, leave the seeds too long and you might end up as a human planter. Imagine the roots growing deeper and deeper into your flesh. It's kind of like that watermelon seed urban legend where if you swallow a seed, you'll grow one of the bulbous fruits in your stomach. Coming in at number five, we've got Ogo Pogo. Let's start with a famous one. Move over, Nessie. We've got a Canadian sea cryptid to discuss. If you've ever been to British Columbia, you'll know that there are plenty of mountains and lakes to explore. One of the more well-known ones, both for its picturesque qualities and supposed housing of a monster, is Lake Okanagan. Situated in Kelowna, this lake is famous for its vacation-friendly beaches. But if you head out looking for a relaxing day on the water, you might meet up with a strange beast. Sightings of the Ogopogo date back to 1972, but indigenous legends have been telling tales of the creature for much longer. It's described as a long, slender creature with many humps and a horse head that peeks out of the lake during thunderstorms. Sound familiar? While not nearly as famous, Ogopogo is quite similar to Nessie when you get down to it. Both are aquatic, hard to find, and attract all sorts of cryptid hunters. All sorts of folks have claimed to see Ogopogo swimming around, popping its head out of the water from time to time. Photos and videos are common, but none are really verifiable or convincing. Thankfully, the creature seems to be relatively friendly. For all these sightings and rumors, there haven't been too many claims of violence or aggression from the lake-dwelling beast. In fact, it's actually quite well-liked by everyone. In the 90s, the Canadian government commissioned a postage stamp in honor of Ogopogo. 
Way to go. Skeptics all have their explanations for what it might actually be, with one prevalent idea claiming that it's actually a primitive whale that only comes out during calmer seasons. Regardless of whether it's real or not, what's more fun to say in the end? Nessie or Ogo Pogo? I'll let you guys decide. Coming in at number four, we've got the University of Toronto Phantom Worker. If a film is being shot in Toronto, you're more than likely gonna catch a glimpse of U of T's campus. The school's buildings are ornate and beautiful, perfect for giving a scholarly feel to any scene. A lot of the buildings have facades that date back to the early 19th century, giving them a timeless feel. Of course, with any buildings that have been around so long, there will be ghost stories. Back in the 1920s, U of T built a gothic memorial to honor students who had died during the First World War. During construction, of this elaborate memorial, many workers were hired to help out. Legend says that one of the workers fell from the tower while polishing the bells, a true hunchback of Notre Dame moment. Ever since that fateful incident, students and faculty alike have claimed to see the ghosts of the worker wandering around campus. Some even claim that there have been ghostly apparitions falling from the tower. Folks who don't know the legend will run to see if the poor fellow is okay, but never find a body. So much for being a good Samaritan. There are many other ghost stories surrounding the university as well, but none so stomach-dropping. Stone maze with murderous qualities, little girls lost in planetariums, and a baker who managed to trap his mistress inside a secret room. The stories are real, but are the ghosts still haunting the campus? I suppose you'll have to pay the institution a visit and find out. Just try not to get roped into paying tuition, alright? That's scarier than any ghost story. Coming in at three, Summit Elementary School. In Amarillo, Texas, there's a haunting legend surrounding a closed and abandoned school that everyone avoids. The Summit Elementary School is one of the most haunted locations in all of Texas, and its dark history makes it a hub for ghosts and spirits alike. The school was open up until 1972, and is haunted for numerous reasons, including a janitor who killed students and stuck them in the boiler, racially motivated murders that took place in the school, and murdered prostitutes hidden in the walls. These are just a few of the legends surrounding the terrifying building. Worse still, legend has it that if you're brave enough to visit the abandoned school at night, your car may do strange things. Swings will move by themselves and you might even hear voices coming from the walls. Honestly, this school is beginning to sound like the one from Marianne, which is a French horror series you all need to watch immediately. Do it. The Queen demands it. Coming in at two, the Candy Lady. Now, this very well might be one of the scariest urban legends I've ever read and may result in a lot of you sleeping with the light on tonight. Sorry in advance. This theory goes, I quote, The Candy Lady allegedly lures children to their doom by leaving enticing goodies on their windowsills just before bedtime. Her plan is for the kids to wait for mum and dad to fall asleep before indulging in the sweet treats so as not to get in trouble. Afterwards, she'll grab them and feast on their sugar laden blood until there isn't any left. Children began to go missing, yet no leads were ever found that would suggest they were kidnapped or ran away. As some of the remaining children got older, they confessed to eating candy left on their windowsills with a note from the candy lady, so parents started to wonder if the other children perhaps had been poisoned. The worry was soon put to rest when someone actually turned up dead. Not a child though, but a sheriff's deputy who had been investigating the disappearances. His eyes had been stabbed out with a fork, and his pockets stuffed with candy. A farmer also found a child sized set of teeth inside a candy wrapper one morning while tending to his fields. Very creepy. The legend still remains in Texas, and whenever children go missing, people are very quick to blame the candy lady. And finally coming in at number one, Black Eyed Children. Black Eyed Children or Black Eyed Kids are a contemporary legend of supposed paranormal creatures that resemble children between the ages of 6 and 16 with pale skin and black eyes who are reportedly seen hitchhiking or are encountered on doorsteps of residential homes. Now children are creepy already, they say strange things and their innocence allows them to breach the barrier between the living and the dead that we jaded adults just don't possess. However, the Black Eyed Children legend is one for the history books and is downright terrifying. In the late 90s, a journalist named Brian Bethel was working in his town of Abilene, Texas, when he encountered something he'll never forget. He was parked outside a movie theater when two children knocked on his window. Brian couldn't quite understand why, but he was completely overcome with fear at the sight of them. He rolled down the window regardless, and the kids asked him for a ride back to their home so that they could get cash for the movie. His fear, however, made him hesitate, but the children were persistent. They then began to say some weird things things, like we're not armed or anything. Brian looked back at the kids and noticed how their eyes had turned pitch black. They then began screaming at him that they could only come in the car if he invited them in. So 
he quickly drove away. He spread the word about the black eyed children and was surprised when a lot of other people came forward reporting similar experiences. In at number 5 we have the beast of Hackney marshes. This legend dates back to 1981 when 4 kids were crossing the marshes on a winter's morning. It is said that they happened upon, I quote, a giant great growling hairy thing. Naturally people began to assume that this was some kind of hideous monster. It remained a legend going forward but wasn't spotted again until 2012 when it was captured on camera. Helen Murray, a university student, was out for a stroll near the dense woodland area when she said she was stopped in her tracks by an unknown animal, which she stated was larger than a person and covered in shaggy black fur. I quote, I tried to stay calm as I wasn't sure what kind of animal it was or if it was even alive. I had my phone ready to call 999, then the creature moved. Somehow I managed to take a couple of pictures before I ran. I managed to get away but was scared half to death. Now she didn't contact the police because she feared they wouldn't believe her, however the story certainly revived memories of the unexplained sighting that occurred in 81. Officers have stated that they believe neither of these sightings were hoaxes and that two bear carcasses had previously been found nearby in the river Lee and to this day it remains a mystery how they even got there. So were the bears killed by this creature? Were the bears the creature? We don't have bears in England so… stumped. In at number 4, the killer pool in Epping Forest. Epping Forest is a 2400 hectare area of ancient woodland between Epping in Essex and Forest Gate in Greater London. Over 100 lakes and ponds are found in the forest, however there is only one that is referred to as the killer or suicide pool. This legend grew rapidly in popularity after Irish author Elliot O'Donnell wrote about it in his book Haunted Britain, stating that there is a pool in Epping Forest that is home to unearthly presences, some miserable and some evil. Evil. Now there is one story about the pool that goes as follows. Around 300 years ago a couple engaged in a forbidden relationship, meeting secretly at the pond in the forest. However, the girl's father found out about the relationship and in a fit of anger he killed her at the pool. After learning about his girlfriend's death, the lover committed suicide at the very same spot. Following these tragic events no birds were heard and no animals were ever seen in that area again. The water also became dank, and not dank in a good way, bad dank. On top of that it is said that people with no inclination went on to commit suicide there including a woman in 1887 and a young servant, Emma Morgan, who killed herself and her child. Jumping forward to 1959 a competition in a magazine was held to find the exact location of the pool. One writer claimed to know but refused to reveal the details, stating that the place was evil beyond measure. I quote, The suicide pool is deep in the heart of the forest, far from any road. It is dank, evil and malignant, with an atmosphere unpleasant beyond description. It doubt if the sunshine ever penetrates through the surrounding trees. If it did, it would never lighten the black waters. Coming in at number 3, we've got the Nenner Look. We've talked about urban legends from the far west coast and the most populous city, so now let's take a trip out east. Known for its quaint, peaceful charm, Newfoundland is the last place you'd expect to find terrifying urban legends, right? I mean, you can get screeched in and end up with a scary hangover and only a faint memory of your previous night, but that's something else entirely. The monster seen near Newfoundland dwells in the sea, but does so unconventionally. How do you think sea monsters usually get around? By swimming, right? Well, this thing acts a little differently than most. First sighted by Sir Humphrey Gilbert back in the 16th century, it was described as a lion-like creature. This fits the description of an Inuit cryptid known as the Nenerluk. Legends of such a creature have been passed down through generations of people, but it was considered just a legend to outsiders until Sir Humphrey Gilbert came across it himself. The Nenerluk is a gigantic beast estimated to be as tall as an iceberg. It's got white fur, huge ears, and loves to eat anything that gets close enough. Seals are the classic meal, but it won't turn down a human if they get close. Now back to that bit about movement. The Nenerluk doesn't swim, it walks along the bottom of the ocean. Yep, not the most efficient way to get around, but it gets the job done. Imagine watching a gigantic beast just walk out of the sea towards you. This is also the reason why people say that it's not really ever seen away from shore. It makes sense considering how deep the ocean is. But if you ever spot a little antenna poking out of the water, it's time to get a move on. And if you ever hear a deafening roar, it's probably too late. Coming in at number 2 we've got the Cabbage Town Tunnel Monster. We'll return to Toronto for a moment, you know, because of the urban qualities of these legends. Get it? Well, every tunnel system has its fair share of legends and the Cabbage Town Tunnel is no exception. I'm surprised nobody's gone back and tried to get footage of this strange creature. Back in the 70s, a kitten ran away from home. While searching for his lost feline, a man came across a tunnel in Cabbage Town. Thinking that the kitten might have run in here to hide, he descended down into the abyss. Scanning the darkness for any sign of the little animal, he noticed some motion off to the side. 
Thinking it might be what he was looking for, the man pointed his flashlight at the movement and saw something he was definitely not expecting, neither cute nor cuddly. He claims to have seen a monkey-like creature with glowing orange eyes standing at half the height of a man covered in gray fur. If that horrible sight wasn't enough, listen to this. The man froze up and kept his light trained on the monster. The monster didn't like this much and told the man in an awful, trembling voice, go away go away. And guess what the man did next? He hightailed it out of there and didn't look back. This story made its way around for a while, but nobody ever properly looked into it. That is, until a year later. The man's friend had convinced him to share his story, so he went to the Toronto Sun with the scoop. A reporter accompanied him back to the tunnel, and they both scoured the inside. Looking around, they didn't find any evidence of a monster, but they did discover the remains of a cat. Some speculate that the tunnel leads to a point in the Toronto sewer system, and others have different ideas. Either way, nobody has seen the Cabbage Town sewer monster since. Would you go looking? Finally, at number one, we've got the ghost ship of Northumberland Strait. Heading back east for a moment, let's consider the Northumberland Strait. This is a body of water that separates Prince Edward Island from Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. It's said that there is a ghost ship that sails upon the strait, more often than not totally engulfed in flame. The legend dates back over 200 years and always seems to play out the same way. Folks on land will look out to see a beautiful schooner with pure white sails. As they look on, these sails will catch fire and the whole ship starts burning. Often people will head out on rescue missions only to find that there was never a ship to begin with. Legend says that the ship will only appear before a northeast wind, predicting a storm. So where does this ghost ship come from and why does it always come back? Well, some people believe that the ship was captained by a pirate who made a deal with the devil. The ship had been fired upon and was burning fast. He wanted his treasure hidden and protected, so he signed the pact and sealed his fate. Now he and his crew are doomed to to sail forever on this perpetually burning ship. Yikes. Now, skeptics will tell you that the ghost ship is simply a mirage, but if that were the case, then how do they explain the flame? Coming in at number five, we've got Water Blades. While this may be a tale told around the world, it seems to have a strong presence in Italy. Sure, the name sounds cool, maybe even conjuring up some images of wicked aquatic swords, but the reality of Water Blades is horrific. In fact, if you really like water parks, you might want to skip this entry altogether. I don't want to just ruin them forever for you. We've all heard of razor blades and other assorted sharp objects showing up where they shouldn't. Halloween candy, playground equipment, door handles, and more. But those are all relatively controllable once you've realized the present danger. Water blades, on the other hand, will rip and tear until there's nothing left. The urban legend floating around implies that some folks have been fastening razor blades to parts of water slides at popular theme parks in Italy. You can imagine what might happen if someone went slip sliding down one of these horrible traps. Mame is an understatement in cases like these. Thankfully, this urban legend seems to be staunchly set in the false category. For something that purportedly happens quite often, reports of such activity are very rare. The actual affliction of rapidly descending individuals doesn't seem to happen. Still, the legend must be very effective, especially because it seems to get told so often. I suppose the lesson to be learned from this one is be careful using public facilities. Good advice, especially in these days and times. Coming in at number four, we've got Piers and Freda's Alien Encounters. Everyone knows a friend of a friend who claims to have been abducted by aliens, and if not abducted, then maybe they saw a UFO or something. But this Italian security guard has a claim to fame so out there it might as well be in outer space. He says that he was abducted by aliens five times over the course of three years. All abductions happened in Genoa, all apparently while he was still working the night shift. Skeptics, as skeptics do, dismiss these claims, but apparently he's given details of each abduction while under the influence of truth serum. Pretty astronomical, don't you think? The very first abduction occurred late one night. Zanfretta was patrolling and saw what appeared to be four lights. After seeing this, the engine lights and radio went out in his patrol car. Thinking, as most security guards should, that there might be thieves about, he ran over to investigate. He did not discover a group of miscreants, though. No, he found himself face to face with some extraterrestrial life. A UFO was floating above and he was abducted by these outer space dwelling individuals. While approaching the so-called scene of the crime, Zenfredo was grabbed from behind. When he turned around, he saw a creature he could only describe as an enormous, green, ugly, and frightful creature with undulating skin as though he were very fat or dressed in a loose gray tunic, no less than 10 feet tall. This, of course, was only the beginning of Zanfretta's galactic incidents. He's run 
into interplanetary assailants again and again, sometimes even when he had backup. Following some encounters, special investigators were called in. They discovered distinct markings on the ground that didn't seem of human origin, but nobody but Zenfreda has laid eyes on the creatures themselves. His claims have intensified the belief of an alien presence near Genoa and has made a bit of a celebrity out of the now elderly security guard. His last abduction took place in 1980 while he was under close observation. These days, he claims that the aliens contact him directly, communicating with questionable motivation. So if you're at all interested in close encounters with the third kind, Genoa might be the place to be. In at number three, we have the ghost of the Grey Lady and Longleat House. Longleat House is an English stately home and the seat of the Marquis of Bath. The house was originally built by Sir John Tyne and was designed mainly by Robert Smithson after Longleat Priory was destroyed by fire in 1567. It took almost 12 years to complete and is often regarded as one of the finest examples of Elizabethan architecture in Britain. Sounds magical, right? Well, it has a dark side, one of deceit and murder. It all began back in 1733 when Lady Louisa married Viscount Weymouth, who owned the Longleat estate. Louisa moved into the home with him, bringing with her a number of her own servants. It was said that she was fond of one of her footmen, who she described as loyal and true. Now, this favouritism wasn't taken well among the other servants, and out of jealousy, they told Viscount Weymouth that the footman was having an affair with Louisa, which of course wasn't true. Now, this is where the story gets a little blurry. Some say Weymouth paid someone to push the footman down the stairs, while others say he did it himself. Either way, the footman broke his neck, and his body was buried in the cellar. This took a toll on Lady Louisa, who developed pneumonia, which resulted in her death at the young age of 22. According to visitors of Long House, you can find a lady dressed in grey creeping along the house's corridors, especially close to the library where the footman died. Coming in at number two, we have the Beast of Bodmin Moor. The Beast of Bodmin Moor is a phantom cat purported to live in Cornwall, England. The creature is said to be panther like and black furred, with it stalking around Bodmin Moor killing livestock. Sightings of the beast were reported back in 1978 after mutilated slain livestock were found in the area. Some people proposed that the beast had escaped from a zoo, and as it was illegal to own one privately, the former owner could not report it to the police. It has been claimed that animal trainer Mary Chipperfield had released three pumas into the wild following the closure of her Plymouth Zoo in 1978, and perhaps this is what gave rise to rumours of the beast. Jumping forward to 1995, the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food conducted an official investigation, with there being no verifiable evidence of exotic felines loose in Britain, and that instead the livestock could have been killed by indigenous species. However, less than a week after the government report, Boy was walking by the River Fowey when he discovered a large cat skull, measuring about 4 inches long by 7 inches wide. The skull was lacking its lower jaw, but possessed three sharp, prominent canines that suggest it may have been a leopard. It was immediately sent to the Natural History Museum in London for verification, with them determining that it was a genuine skull from a young male leopard. And finally, in at number one, we have Spring Heeled Jack. Originating from Victoria era Britain, Spring Heeled Jack is a character from urban legend that was first supposedly sighted by in 1837. However, over the years, more frequent tales have emerged. His name is said to come from his ability to leap over great distances and heights. Not too shabby. The very first sighting of Spring Hill Jack came in October of 1837, when a woman named Murray Stevens was walking to Lavender Hill when a tall coated man leapt from the building into the street. He then grabbed her with his metal claws and kissed her before tearing at her clothes. After her screams were heard, he fled the scene, leaping back into the building he came from. Following the encounter, more accounts occurred with the most notable being the Alsop case. The Alsop case was one of the most widespread stories about Jack, with it being published in several newspapers. Jane Alsop recalls the moments when she was attacked, stating, I answered the door of my father's house to a man claiming to be a police officer, who told me to bring a light, claiming, we have caught spring heeled Jack here in the lane. I brought the person a candle and noticed that he wore a large cloak. The moment I had handed him the candle, however, he threw off the cloak and presented a most hideous and frightful appearance, vomiting blue and and white flame from his mouth while his eyes resembled red balls of fire. She also reported that he wore a large helmet and that his clothing, which appeared tight fitting, resembled white oil skin. No one was ever caught and identified as Spring Heel Jack, which of course led to numerous theories of his nature and identity. Skeptical investigators have dismissed these stories though and claim Spring Heel Jack is a product of mass hysteria, which developed around various stories of a boogeyman and devil. Coming in at five, rats in the toilet. 
Urban legends about animals in sewers have been rife throughout history, with the most notable being the alligators and crocodiles in the sewers of New York, which for the most part actually turned out to be true. However, the thought of finding something in your toilet inches away from vulnerable areas of your body, well that's something nobody wants to think about. While the alligators and crocodiles are a far reach, this legend seems to have some elements of truth. A toilet drain is just wide enough for a rat to climb up, first and foremost, with the animals being attracted to sewage lines due to undigested food in feces. They follow the pipes and boom, wind up in your toilet bowl. Back in 1999, a woman in Virginia got a nasty fright when she went to the toilet and found a rat there waiting for her. Honestly, I've never feared a toilet before, but I certainly do now. Apparently this has happened enough times for public officials to put out a warning. If you encounter a rat in your toilet, close the lid and flush. Godspeed. Coming in at number four, The Bunny Man. The Bunny Man is an urban legend that originated in Fairfax County, Virginia back in 1970. The legend has many variations, but for the most part involves a man wearing a rabbit costume who attacks people with an axe or hatchet. Most of the stories occur around Colchester Overpass, a southern railway overpass spanning Colchester Road near Clifton, Virginia, sometimes referred to as Bunny Man Bridge. In the tale, an escaped mental patient takes to gutting bunnies and hanging them from the bridge but later escalated to the madman hanging teens in a similar manner. However, the legend is based out of reality. Following extensive research into the bunny man, the legend was linked to two cases of a man in rabbit costumes threatening people with an axe. With the vandalism reports occurring 10 days apart in 1970 in Burke, Virginia. The first incident occurred on the night of October 19th, 1970 by US Air Force Academy Cadet Robert Bennett and his fiance who were visiting relatives in Burke. While returning from a football game that evening, they reportedly parked their car in a field to visit an uncle who lived across the street. As they sat in the car, they noticed something moving outside the rear window. Moments later, the front passenger window smashed and there stood a figure in a bunny costume. As they drove away, the couple discovered a hatchet on the car floor. The second reported sighting occurred on the night of October 29th, 1970, when construction security guard Paul Phillips approached a man standing on a porch of a home on Guinea Road. The man was wearing a white bunny costume and appeared to be around 20 years old. According to Paul, the man stated, I quote, you are trespassing passing. If you come any closer, I'll chop off your head. Now, while neither instance resulted in death or disembowelment, the thought of an adult in a bunny costume wielding a hatchet is absolutely terrifying. Coming in at number three, we've got the Mazarol. Speaking of non-human entities, let's take a quick trip to the mountains. The Italian Dolomites, to be specific. No relation to the comedian turned movie star recently played by Eddie Murphy. This mountain range sits stoutly in northeastern Italy and is full of legends and secrets. Plenty of cryptids and creatures are said to roam these mysterious mountains from fairies to wizards and witches to mythical royalty. But the creature that piques my interest the most is the Mazarol. In the valleys of Belluno province, this myth is still well known and widespread. This tiny playful creature resembles a gnome. So make sure you tag your friends and let them know they've been known. Ooh. Now that I've made my requisite meme reference for the day, I can get to the actual details. This tiny cap-wearing dude dressed in red wanders around the woods. For him to simply wander would be kind of boring though, so of course there's some darkness to this myth. He loves to find folks traveling around dusk and then lead them astray. Anyone who treads on top of his footprints is compelled by forces unknown to follow them all the way back to the no man's cave, after which they will forget everything about themselves. Many a tourist has fallen victim to the Mazarol's mean-spirited trickery. Some legends even say that the Mazarol will abduct the occasional individual and make them his slave. The story goes that the gnome managed to steal a young woman away from her village and put her to work. He was kind during this time and taught her many skills, cheese making, butter churning, and more. He even promised to teach her how to extract wax from whey. However, he was never able to complete this final task as one day a hunter stumbled upon the missing girl and brought her back home. A remedy made from goat's milk brought her memory back and the girl, overwhelmed with gratitude, taught the villagers how to make cheese and butter. To to this day though, nobody has figured out how to extract wax from whey. Maybe someone will seek out the Mazarol and find out though. Coming in at number two, we've got the Witches of Monta Matana. More mountainous mythical monsters are waiting for you. If you make your way out to Monta Matana, you will find world-class hiking and some unexpected extracurriculars. That's right, you can go witch hunting. Years ago, it was said that this mountain was a popular spot for witches to perform rituals and human sacrifices. They practiced their magics upon the crags and cliffs and amassed great fortunes. 
reincarnations of these witches are said to return often in search of their material wealth from past lifetimes. The reality of this wealth is often called into question, but that doesn't stop treasure seekers from braving the range. Some of these booty seekers say they've encountered violent witches willing to slit their throats, but have somehow made it out alive. Maybe other proverbial pirates didn't make it out so well. Either way, Monta Matana is well known for magic, and you'd probably be best off if you just avoided making the perilous journey at night. Unless you'd like to run into some witches, and in that case, I'll reserve judgment. And finally, at number one, we've got Poveglia Island. This tiny island about a half mile from Venice has been shut off from the public for years. Some call it the Plague Island. Why? Well, I'll get to explain it. In the late 18th and early 19th centuries, this fortified island was used as a quarantine station. Over 160,000 infected folks were brought here to live out their last painful days away from the healthier portion of the population. Many mass graves have been discovered nearby over the years, proving how unfortunate anyone who paid Poveglia a visit it really was. Napoleon stored weapons on this island as well, and when it was discovered, many small battles were waged. This, of course, added to the island's body count. Even later on, a mental hospital was built on the island. Legends say that one of the doctors in charge would treat his patients horribly, often torturing them and tossing them from the bell tower. With all these horrifying historic events taking place on the island, it's no wonder that folks think it's haunted. In fact, there's absolutely zero public access to this island. The folks in charge have deemed it too dangerous to visit, venturing out to Poveglia is literally illegal. What could they be hiding out there? In a number five, we have Puchin, the Puchin hell from southern Chile, and is a creature from Mapuche mythology and Chilotl mythology. The Puchin is described as a shape shifting creature, highly feared, that can instantly change into animal form wherever it so desires. Throughout different stories, it has often been described as a gigantic flying snake, which produces strange whistling sounds, while its gaze could paralyze any victim it chooses, kind of like Medusa in that way. And Permit it to suck its blood. In Chile, the word Puchin also designates to the common vampire bat. So some cryptozoologists believe that common vampire bat is the origin of the legend. However, some believe that the Puchin could be related to the chupacabra, something we'll be discussing later on. Spoiler alert. It is said that the only people who can defeat the Puchin are Machi Mapuche medicine women. That was a mouthful. In at number 4 we have Duendes. A Duende, for those who don't know, is a creature from South America that originated from the phrase possessor of a house and was originally conceptualized as a mischievous spirit inhabiting a home. Now, Duendes appear to pop up in many cultures around the world. In Portugal, the word is used to describe beings of a small stature wearing big hats, whistling a mystical song, while walking in the forest. It is said that they lure young girls and boys to the forest, causing them to lose their way home. However, in Latin America, this differs slightly. Duendes are believed to be the helpers of people who got lost in the forest so they could find their way home. They are also known to be gnome-like creatures who live inside the walls of homes, especially the bedroom walls of young children. As you can tell, the legend differs from region to region, some believing they are the souls of infants who died before they could be baptized. Others simply portray them as malevolent spirits that hide in homes and wreak havoc. Regardless of that, they are nasty little suckers who cause problems wherever they go. Coming in at number three, we have Polybius. Polybius is an urban legend that emerged back in the early 2000s, with it concerning a supposedly fictitious arcade game called Polybius. The legend describes the game as part of a government-run crowdsourced psychology experiment which was based in Portland during 1981. According to the legend, the game apparently produced intense psychoactive and addictive effects in players, with the machines being said to have been periodically visited by men in black for the purpose of data mining the machines and analysing the effects. Now, while the entire legend doesn't quite hold up, there are some pieces that are actually based in fact. Brian Dunning, host of the Skeptoid podcast, did some digging and discovered that a 12-year-old named Brian Mara had become sickened during a 28-hour marathon video game contest in Portland back in 1981. Just a few short days later, the Portland arcades were raided by federal agents who seized cabinets that were being used for gambling. Add these two events and add some fictitious elements and you have the legend of Polybius. <laughs> Coming in at number two, we have Candyman. The Candyman is an urban legend that tells the story of a murdered slave who returns from the dead in search of revenge if you say his name five times. In 1992, a Candyman movie was released based on the short story The Forbidden by Clive Barker. This in turn sparked two sequels, as well as a slew of paranormal games that friends dare each other to play. According to the urban legend, if you look into a mirror and chant the name Candyman five times, he will appear behind you and kill you with his hook. Now, although this is 
a legend and you will likely not invoke him by saying his name, there is some reality to the story. In the Candyman movie, after saying his name five times, Candyman breaks through the medicine cabinet in a bathroom in order to kill his victim. This part is factual, believe it or not. Back in 1987, the Chicago Reader published a story about Ruth McCoy, a woman living in a Chicago housing project who called 911, insisting she was being attacked. When responders arrived, they found her shot body, with investigators determining that her assailants had gained access to her unit by climbing through her medicine cabinet, which adjoins the apartments. The complex was supposedly built that way so that plumbers could attend to leaks by simply removing the cabinet to reach the pipes. However, this in turn resulted in people using the method to burgle and murder. Absolutely terrifying. And finally, coming in at number one, we have Cropsey. Once upon a time, Cropsey was a mere urban legend, the boogeyman of Staten Island in New York City. Cropsey was rumored to be a homicidal madman who had escaped from a mental institution and had a hook for a hand, who supposedly hunted children and dragged them back to the tunnel system under an abandoned hospital. Parents would often use Cropsey as a way to frighten their children into being good and staying close to home. The urban legend became so popular it inspired a 1981 slasher movie called The Burning, which very quickly became a cult classic. However, what was thought to be fiction quite quickly became reality. In the 1980s, Cropsey came to life in the form of a deranged killer who really did kidnap children. He was called Andre Rand. Rand was a janitor at the Willowbrook State School on Staten Island, which would eventually be closed in 1987 due to corporate punishment and rampant sexual abuse. In 1981, Holly Ann Hughes did not return home after going to the store to buy soap. Rand supposedly pulled up, pulling Holly into his car and driving away. Then again in 1983, 11-year-old Thais Jackson was reported missing after her mother had sent her to purchase food. She never returned. She was last seen exiting the Mariners Harbor Motel in Staten Island days after Rand had been released from prison. Then in 1987, Jennifer Schweiger was reported missing, and her body was later found underground after a 35-day search. Rand was ultimately convicted of the crime. A documentary about the madman was made entitled Cropsey, in which they speculate that Rand may have been involved with Satanism and provided the children to be sacrificed. Ultimately, Rand was sentenced 25 years to life in prison, with eligibility for parole in 2037, at which time he'll be 93 years old. Number five, Hans Trapp. So for as long as there's been a jolly old Saint Nick providing gifts for well-behaved little ones, there has been somebody or something filling in the role of his counterpart, punishing the naughty ones. These fearsome figures range from the iconic horned Krampus, we all know Krampus, to Perta, the shape-shifting Christmas witch who fills folks' bellies with straw. So if you're misbehaving, ugh. Granted, I think the most terrifying one out of all of them is Hans Trapp. It's the classic tale of a man selling his soul to become rich in the 15th century. Now, the legend of the Christmas scarecrow is well known in the French regions of Alsace and Lorraine. His thirst for power was so great that he turned to deals with the devil to enhance said power and status. Hearing of this, the Pope himself excommunicated Trapp, after which he was banished from Alsace. Alsace? I couldn't really find a pronunciation, so let me know in the comments. And his wealth and lands confiscated. Lonely and mad, Trapp lived out the rest of his days at a cabin high in the mountains, somewhere in, you know, the region. There, he continued to brood, and his evil desires festered. He also developed a hankering to try the taste of human flesh. Finally, he became the dreaded Christmas scarecrow. Adorned in straw as a disguise, he waited on lonely roads for a victim. And one day, a small boy came across the dwelling, and a hungry, unstable Trap cooked him for dinner. As we would have it though before he could dig in, Trap was struck by lightning, and that was the end of him. His story lives on in the form of a boogeyman-like tale that says he sometimes returns to civilization on Christmas, going door to door in search of another meal. So, check your peephole before you open your door on Christmas Eve, or any day. Number four, Mary Lou. So this is the textbook definition of nightmare fuel, and I'm sorry for proving that here. However, the iconic holiday traditions, which is said to be derived from some sort of religious rite, possibly paganism, in the early 1800s simply could not be left off of today's list. So the creature itself is a horse's skull that is decorated with ribbons and affixed to a pole. The back of the skull is attached with a white sheet, which drapes down to conceal both the pole and the individual carrying this device. So on occasion, the horse's head was represented by not a skull. Instead, it was made from wood or paper. And in some instances, the horse's jaw was able to open and close as a result of a string or a lever attached to it. And there are accounts of some pieces of glass being affixed into the eye sockets, you know, to represent eyes. 
This custom was first recorded in 1800, with subsequent accounts of it being produced into the early 20th century. According to these, the Marilud was a tradition performed at Christmas time by groups of men who would accompany the horse on its travels around local areas. Although the makeup of such groups varied, they typically included an individual to carry the horse, a leader, and individuals dressed as stock characters. The men would carry the figure to local houses where they would request entry through song. The householders would be expected to deny them entry, again through song, and the two sides would continue the responses to one another in this manner. If the householders eventually relented, the team would be permitted entry and given food and drink. Although the custom was given various names, it was best known as, yeah, Mary Lud. The etymology of this term remains a subject of academic debate, by the way. The folklorist Iorth C. Pete believed the term meant Holy Mary. It was as a reference to Mary, mother of Jesus, while the folklorist E. C. Kant thought it was more likely that the term had originally meant gray mare, referring to the head's, you know, equine appearance. Several earlier folklorists who examined the topic, such as Pete and Ellen Etlinger, believed the tradition had once been a pre-Christian religious rite, although scholarly support for this interpretation has declined amid a lack of supporting evidence. The absence of late medieval references to such practices and the geographic dispersal of the various British hooded animal traditions among them, you know, the hoodening of Kent, the broad of Cotswolds, and the old ball, old top, and old horse of northern England, have led to suggestions that they derive from the regionalized popularization of the 16th and 17th century fashion for hobby horses among the social elite. Although the tradition declined in the early to mid 20th century, partly due to opposition from some local Christian clergy and changing social conditions, it was revived in new forms in the mid to latter part of the century. The tradition has also inspired various artistic depictions, appearing for instance in the work of the painter Clive Hicks Jenkins and the poet Vernon Watkins. So if you encounter a horse skull on your doorstep, congratulations! Apparently you've got some good luck. Anybody got a spare horse skull? Coming in at number 3, El Chupacabra, also known as the Chupacabra, this is a goat sucker, a legendary creature that was first reported back in the mid 90s. The name itself comes from the animal's reported habit of attacking and drinking the blood of livestock, including goats. Now there is actually said to be two kinds of Chupacabra, one is a reptilian kind, the true Chupacabra, and a canine kind, who are also called blue dogs. The first known sightings and attacks occurred back in March of 1995 in Puerto Rico. Eight sheep were found dead, each strange blood. Investigators found three strange puncture wounds in the chest of the animal. A few months later in August, an eyewitness, Madeline Tolentino, reported seeing the creature in the town of Canovanas, when as many as 150 farm animals and pets were reportedly killed by the creature. Jumping forward to 1975, similar killings in the town of Mocha were attributed to the vampire of Mocha. It was initially believed that these acts were committed by a satanic cult, but later more killings were reported around the island, and many farms reported loss of animal life. Each of the animals were reported to have had their body bled dry through a series of small incisions. Now, like I mentioned before, the most common description of the chupacabra is that of a reptile like creature, said to have leathery or scaly greenish grey skin and sharp spines or quills running down its back. The other popular description is that of a strange breed of wild dog. It is described as being hairless and has a pronounced spinal ridge, unusually pronounced eye sockets, fangs, and even claws. In at number two, La Llorona. Hailing from Hispanic folklore, La Llorona, which I'm pronouncing correctly now after you guys yelled at me in a previous video, is also known as the Wailing Woman or even the Crier. This is a legend about a woman who drowned her children in a lake and now mourns their deaths for eternity, roaming South America as a ghost or apparition. The story itself goes as follows. The woman was unloved by her husband and one day she caught him with another woman. So as revenge, she drowned her sons in a river in grief and anger, and then drowned herself after she realized what she did. She was ultimately refused entry into heaven, for obvious reasons, unless she found the souls of her two sons. So now legend states that she roams the earth, hunting for the souls of her sons, with her cries and wails luring in innocent victims. La Llorona kidnaps wandering children at night, mistaking them for her own. Folks who have claimed to have seen her say that she appears at night or in the late evening by rivers or lakes, wearing a white gown with a veil. And some believe that if you hear the cries of La Llorona, you are marked for death. Now, one particular encounter went as follows. A boy and his family were sitting near a creek between Mora and Guadalapita in New Mexico when they saw the form of a tall, thin woman. She seemed to float over the water and end up the hill out of sight until returning a little later closer to them. The family had suspicions that she was La Llorona, so they went to the shore to see if there were footprints, and there were none. Creepy stuff. More interesting still, the earliest reference to La Llorona was actually in a sonnet written by Mexican poet Manuel Carpio in the late 1800s, where he identifies her as the ghost of a woman who was drowned by her husband. And finally, coming in at number one, we have El Silbon. Hailing from Colombia as well as Venezuela, El Sabon, also known as the Whistler, is a legendary figure described as a lost soul. This tale originated in the 19th century, with the Whistler being described as the harbinger of death. 
According to the legend, a son kills his father after he returns home to find his father attacking his mother. This angered the boy, resulting in him killing his father. Another version is a tad more disconcerting and states that the son was a spoiled brat, and on one afternoon, he demanded that his father hunt for a deer, his favourite meal. However, when his father did not find any deer and instead returned empty handed, his son killed him and cut out his heart, cooking them for dinner. Following this, a mother grabbed the boy's grandfather, who then tied the boy to a tree and unleashed the vicious dog on him. As this was happening, his mother put a curse on the boy, which ultimately condemned him to wander the plains as a ghost, carrying a sack of bones on his back. Some versions of the story state that these bones are of his father, while others state that these are the bones of his victims. Now, the whistler is said to have a characteristic whistle that resembles the musical note C D E F G A B in that order. It is said that when the whistling sounds close, there's no danger, but if the whistling is far away, it means the whistler is nearby. Very confusing, I know. It is also stated that hearing the whistler foretells one's own death, and in this situation, the only thing that can save the victims is the sound of a barking dog. Many people from Venezuela have said that they have spotted the whistler, primarily in the summer. However, it is mainly on rainy days that the whistler wanders, hungry for death and eager to punish drunkards, womanizers or even innocent victims. It is said that the whistler will suck the alcohol out of drunkards through their navel when it finds them alone, and it tears womanizers to pieces, removes their bones and puts them in the sack where it keeps the remains of its father. Lovely stuff. Number 5. Red Rooms I'm just going to start this off by getting the obvious out of the way. This has nothing to do with the Fifty Shades trilogy. So don't bother asking about that icky series that barely knows the truth about anything schmexy. Among the many illicit activities that take place on the dark web, one of the most disturbing is the existence of Red Rooms. So these rooms have gained a lot of attention and infamy, with many rumors and myths circulating about their existence and operation. While some people believe that Red Rooms are nothing more than urban legends, Others claim to have witnessed them firsthand. So, in fact, on Reddit, 4chan, and Hidden Wiki, a kind of, you know, cliff notes for dark web beginners, you can find people trading second and third and fourth hand accounts of red rooms that have opened and closed. The concept of red rooms first apparently appeared on the dark web sometime in the early 2010s, and their name derives from the color of the room where the supposed acts take place. The term red room gained popularity after a Japanese animation featured a pop up ad asking, Do you like the red room? And if users attempted to close the ad, a full sized window would open with the names of individuals who had supposedly accessed the red room before and were found uh, dead. The idea is that viewers pay to watch a live stream of a person being tormented and eventually killed, and they can even interact with the tormentor and other viewers through chat or messaging functions. Payments for these services are made in cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin to ensure, you know, anonymity. Despite the attention that red rooms have received, it's kind of challenging to determine whether they actually exist or not. But here's the thing, accessing them is not as difficult as one might expect. As Simple Google search for redroom.onion, uh, that link uh, can yield results for these supposedly hidden pages. In addition, the technical limitations of the dark web make it almost impossible to stream live video, and payment analyses suggest that there are very few people actually paying for these services. Some people claim to have accessed them and seen the gruesome acts taking place, while others insist that they are nothing more than hoaxes designed to scare people. There have been no verified cases of people being killed in real time on the dark web, and many experts believe that the concept of red rooms is more of a fantasy than a reality. One reason why it's so challenging to verify the existence of these red rooms is uh, because the dark web is notoriously difficult to navigate and monitor. It's impossible to search for specific websites on the dark web using traditional search engines like Google or Bing, and accessing dark web sites requires specialized software like Tor or I2P. Furthermore, many dark websites use encryption and other security measures to protect their users' identities and activities, making it pretty challenging to track or trace them. However, there have been some instances where law enforcement agencies have claimed to have shut down red rooms or arrested their operators. In 2015, the FBI arrested a man named Peter Scully in the Philippines who was accused of running a red room called Daisy's Destruction. The site was said to feature videos of Scully harming young people, and it was allegedly one of the most extreme examples of a red room ever discovered. Scully was eventually convinced of multiple crimes, including, you know, young people sexual harm, human selling, and killing. Internet users continue to seek out the elusive and horrifying red rooms on sites like Reddit and 4chan, despite many claims that, you know, it's nothing more than an urban legend. But let me know your take in the comments. Honestly, I believe they're out there, but I've also watched way too many crime shows for my own good. Number four, what's for sale? I have wandered many an oddities market in my time, and you know, heck, I've even performed an act at one that would make most people flinch. I've seen folks selling real and fake bones, demonic dolls, niche, um, schmexy fine leather goods, vintage clothes, tarot readings, banned books, World War II memorabilia, and oddities I can't even begin to describe. And heck, that's just the stuff like I can remember off the top of my head. So 
What does the dark web have that I can't find in a niche marketplace? Oh, the um, no no pills and powders. Sadly, I don't think I'm allowed to say the D word on here, so pardon me if things take a turn for the Looney Tunes way of speaking for safety's sake. I found plenty of tales on the interwebs about the crafty ways folks have been mailed their purchases. User OiRaves on Reddit is adamant that while he personally never received anything from any deep web affiliated sales folk, he did live with a roommate who would constantly receive these strangest brochures. At first, you know, they received stuff for like cruise lines which he wrote off as junk mail, but they came so frequently and started getting stranger, making him suspicious. For folks like me who might be wondering how pamphlets can get strange, apparently the mail ranged from, you know, Christian Minkle brochures to petting zoo brochures, pretty much, you know, any kind of pamphlet for any and all services one could think of. At the time, our narrator kind of felt like someone was gaslighting him, but he never said anything, and the brochures would disappear as quickly as they came, so he didn't really have time to stress it. That is until one fateful day when he walked into his apartment and his roommate was delicately cutting into a brochure to out a small baggie of powder. All I'm gonna say is that it definitely wasn't flour or icing sugar. Now one time our narrator almost threw out a regular sized business envelope since after he opened it up it looked similar to regular silly junk mail until he noticed that the envelope had a hidden flap on the inside where there was um no no things. Other transportation or delivery methods known to the dark webs include using a comic book that's still in the plastic ceiling but the entire back page directly inside the cover was a sheet of acid or a CD in a case you know once again with the plastic sealed and it looked totally ordinary until you peeled back the case artwork. In terms of how some folks get away with powders, pills, and other stuff, apparently the trick is to use collectible Pez dispensers already filled with pills that look like, yep, they've never been opened. Funny story actually about white powder. One time I was doing a virtual script reading of the incredible movie Ready or Not and had to mime using powder of my own and I actually wound up inhaling way too much icing sugar up my nose and oh my god did it ever burn. Thankfully I was off screen after it for a while so I was able to recover in private but it will be a permanent memory for the rest of my life. Number three, the Yule Lights. Look, I hate to be the one to make the comparison, but when I first saw a photo of these little guys, they totally reminded me of the Seven Dwarfs from Snow White, which is one of my favorite Disney movies, so I couldn't understand how they're considered demonic. But I also think Annabelle's adorable and precious, so maybe my view on the world is a little bit warped. The 13 Yule Lads are mischievous winter spirits from Icelandic folklore, and over time they've become a friendlier presence and similar in appearance to Santa Claus. But they haven't always been that way. Once depicted as evil spirits and trolls, the Yule Lads originally represented the dark spirits of nature taking over as winter forest communities indoors and off the mountains. They are the 13 sons of Grilla, a young person eating ogres, symbolic of hunger and scarcity of food. Now, the oldest poems about Grilla describe her as a parasitic beggar. She walks around asking parents to give her their disobedient offspring. Now, her plans can be thwarted by giving her food or chasing her away. And originally she lived in a small cottage, but in later poems she appears to have been forced out of town and into a remote cave. Current day Krila can detect young people who are misbehaving year round. She comes down from the mountains during Christmas time though to search for her uh, meal. So she leaves her cave, hunts them down, and carries them home in her giant sack to devour as her favorite stew. Now according to legend, there's never a shortage of food for her. According to folklore, Grilla has been married three times. Her third husband is said to be living with her in their cave in the you know, lava fields with the big black yule cat and their sons. She supposedly has dozens of offspring with her previous husbands, but they're rarely mentioned nowadays. Right, back to the lads. So they're going to come down to the town and the farms one by one, eventually covering the streets on Christmas Eve, which was when the spirits of winter had fully reclaimed the land. They would then retreat one by one as the days become longer and winter begins to run its course. There were previously as many as 82 Yule lads who were far more cruel and punishing. However, an 18th century royal decree about religious practice and domestic discipline banned parents from using horror stories and monsters to threaten their offspring. As such, the stories became much tamer, leading to the far more generous and only slightly naughty characters present today. In the mid 19th century, author John Arnes drew inspiration from the Brothers Grimm and began collecting folk tales. So his 1862 collection is the first mention of the names of the Yule Lads. So they visit on the 13 nights before Christmas and every single time they make your life a little bit worse than it was before. Young people leave their shoes on the windowsill and the Yule Lads can tell by the shoe whether they've been good or bad. Punishments include stealing your food, slamming all your doors, and stealing your candles. Now each Yule Lad has a different name and visits across, like I said, the 13 days leading up to Christmas. And yes, obviously I'm going to name all 13 guys. It's me. So Sheep Cote Claude harasses sheep but is impaired by his stiff peg legs and arrives first on December 12th. Gully Gog hides in gullies, waiting for an opportunity to sneak into the couch and steal milk. 
and he arrives on December 13th. Stubby is abnormally short and steals pans to eat the crust left on them. Oh, and he arrives on December 14th. Spoon Looker is pretty straightforward. He steals and licks wooden spoons. He's extremely thin due to malnutrition, and I think I'm good with listing when these guys arrive. I'm sure you get the point by now. Pot Scraper simply, you know, steals leftovers from pots, while Bowl Looker hides under beds, waiting for someone to put down their askur, which is a type of bowl with a lid and that was used instead of dishes, which he then steals. Door Slammer obviously likes to slam doors, especially during the night, waking people up. Skir Gobbler has an affinity for skir, which is apparently similar to yogurt. Next up, Sausage Swiper hides in the rafters and snatches sausages that are being smoked. Window Peeper is a snoop who looks through windows in search of things to steal. Doorway Sniffer has an abnormally large nose and an acute sense of smell, which he uses to locate leaf bread. Meat Hook, yeah, you guessed it, uses a hook to steal meat. And finally, Candle Stealer follows young people in order to steal their candles, which were once made of tallow and thus edible. Each of these lads stay for 13 nights, and that's 13 nights too many in my opinion. I need my sleep. Number two, Kaki Kansaros. So they're a malevolent creature in Southeast European and Anatolian folklore. Stories about the Kali Kansaros, or its equivalents, can typically be found in Greece, Bulgaria, Turkey, Serbia, Albania, Bosnia, and Cyprus. These creatures are believed to dwell underground, but come to the surface during the 12 days of Christmas, from December 25th to January 6th. It is believed that while they're underground, they're sawing at the trunk of the tree that holds the earth, so it will collapse along with the earth. According to folklore, when the final part of the trunk is about to be sawed, Christmas dawns and the creatures are able to come to the surface. They forget the tree and come to bring trouble to mortals. Finally, on Epiphany, the sun starts moving again, and they must return underground to continue their sawing. They see that during their absence, the world tree has healed itself, so they must start working all over again. This is believed to occur annually. So these werewolf-like creatures tend to come out at night to cause trouble, play around, but after they've had their fill of the above ground mischief, they go back down there. Rumor has it that leaving a colander on your doorstep is the best practice to ward them off, so excuse me, I gotta go through my kitchen. Number one, Necht Pupect. In the spirit of the season, I figured we could bookend today's list with Santa Sidekicks. He's the most popular gift bringing character in Germany after St. Nicholas, but is virtually unknown outside of the country. He first appears in written sources in the 17th century as a figure in a Nuremberg prisk as a figure in a Nuremberg Christmas procession. Now, Necht Rupert has been mentioned as a companion of St. Nicholas, but he would go from house to house and ask the young folks to pray. If they did, he would give them a treat, but if they didn't, he would give them useless trinkets, such as coal. The worst would come if they refused to even try to pray. He would thrash them with his bag of ashes that he liked to carry around, and it's even said that he would leave a switch for the parents to use during the year. In related folk traditions more closely associated with certain regions in the High Alps, particularly the snowy villages south and west of Salzburg and Austria, the Necht Rupert character functions as St. Nicholas's assistant, rather than as a primary actor in the early December rituals, keeping a watchful eye on the benevolent saint during his journey. Both are, in turn, accompanied in these regions by an assortment of terrifying horned goat-like creatures, you guessed it, Krampus, who seek out and terrorize misbehaving youths identified by St. Nicholas for punishment. The worst offenders are said to be thrashed with birch switches and sometimes stuffed in a hessian sack and thrown into an icy river for their bad deeds. I swear I was good this year, I promise. Starting off this countdown, we have I Know What You Did Last Summer. The 1997 film starring Jennifer Love Hewitt, Sarah Michelle Gellar, and Freddie Prince Jr., among others, is a classic slasher film. It surrounds four young friends who get stalked by a crazy killer with a hook. The film draws inspiration from the urban legend, The Hook which has terrified kids for ages. The Hook or Hook Man is an urban legend about a killer with a hook for a hand that attacks couples in parked cars. Now over the years, this urban legend has changed a number of times, but the main concept is that a couple go out to a place in the woods called Lover's Lane. While cuddling and doing other things, an announcement comes on the radio. It says a prisoner has escaped an asylum and is on the run. He is a known killer who they call the Hook Man because he lost his hand in an accident and replaced it with a hook. Just as this announcement finishes, they hear scraping on the side of the car. The girl is so freaked out that she begs her boyfriend to just drive them home, even though he thinks it's just nothing. Then they arrive home and they notice a bloody hook lodged into the side of their car. Of course, this is just an urban legend, but it may have some roots in real life. Like the 1946 Texarkana Moonlight Murders. Basically a series of murders and attacks on young people parked on lovers' lanes in Texas. The killer has never been caught. People were afraid that these were done by the Hookman, and that the legend came to life. But in reality, the Hookman is just one big urban legend and won't come after you or your friends. In our fourth spot, we have Mothman. 
Chances are you have probably heard of this urban legend. The Mothman originates from West Virginia folklore. Apparently, the Mothman is a large 10-foot tall gray creature with red glowing eyes and wings. On November 15th, 1966, two young couples called the police to report this creature. They said that this large flying man was following their car while they were driving. During the next few days, more and more people reported similar things. The 2002 film The Mothman Prophecies is based off of the 1975 book by the same name. In the film, a reporter is investigating the legend of the Mothman, and it's based on the actual sightings of Mothman that I just discussed. I mean, there's no solid evidence proving that the Mothman is real, so for now, it's just an urban legend. But who knows, maybe in the future we will learn about these creepy sightings and discover what or who was behind them. Number three, hire a hitman. Alrighty, so this is where things get a little more into the like legend part of today's video. One of the greatest myths about the dark web is that you can hire an assassin, with some folks saying that that kind of service costs as little as, you know, five grand. You know, just a couple of months of rent. We all have that kind of money lying around, right? In this economy? Here's the thing, officially speaking, technically no dark web search records were ever found of an actual hit attempt or assassin operating there. Now, I'm not saying it's never happened, since I don't exactly have the time or expertise to go deep diving for a week, you know, to try to find a legitimate person selling those types of services, but what was found by experts? So a network of dark web websites and individuals who accepted Bitcoin in exchange for absolutely nothing at all. I get using Bitcoin for secrecy and all, but trust me when I say you'll never catch me using it as a form of payment. If I ever start talking about cryptocurrency on social media, assume I've been hacked or kidnapped. Scammers out there are relying on the veil of mystery that the dark web has provided. Whereas in reality, more injuries and killings happen through Craigslist in similar websites that are widely available on the surface web. It took me a moment to research that one, but yep, people have actually hired hitmen off of Craigslist for crimes. Granted, it never seems to end like they want it, so I wouldn't really recommend it. Also, leaving a digital trail is always a mistake if you want to do something naughty. Now, I'm not speaking from experience, just common sense. Number two, Silk Road. Silk Road was an online black market in the first modern darknet market that was launched back in 2011 by its American founder, Ross Ulbricht, under the pseudonym Dread Pirate Roberts. Hey look, I love a good reference to the Princess Bride, so that got me. The name Silk Road comes from a historical network of trade routes that were started during the Han Dynasty between Europe, India, China, and many other countries on the Afro-Eurasian landmass. Two other individuals were also closely involved in the site's growth and success, known as Variety Jones and Smedley. In June of 2011, Gawker published an article about the site, which led to an increase in notoriety and website traffic. As part of the dark web, Silk Road operated as a hidden service on the Tor network, allowing users to buy and sell products and services between each other anonymously. To give you an idea of just how widespread it was, a former FBI special agent called it the Amazon of illicit substance sites. According to reliable sources, on Silk Road, you could buy no-no substances, illegal services, you know, like hacking into private accounts, pirated content, fake passports, and more. All transactions were conducted with Bitcoin, which, you know, I guess it does help with protecting user identities, but yeesh. The website was known for its illegal substance marketplace, among other illegal and legal product listings. Between February of 2011 and July of 2013, the site facilitated sales amounting to around 9 million bitcoins. In May of 2013, Silk Road was taken down for a short period of time by a sustained uh, DDoS attack. On June 23rd of 2013, it was first reported that the DEA seized 11.02 bitcoins, then worth a total of $814, which the media suspected was a result of a Silk Road honeypot sting. The FBI has claimed that the real IP IP address of the Silk Road server was found via data leaked directly from the site's CAPTCHA and was located in Iceland. IT security experts have doubted the FBI's claims because technical evidence suggests that no misconfiguration that could cause a specific leak was present at the time, but in October of 2013, the FBI shut down Silk Road and arrested Ross. Silk Road 2.0 came online the next month, run by former site administrators, but was shut down the following year as a part of Operation Onimus. Number 1. Mariana's Web Already not to be confused with Matt Webb, the fantastic guitarist from Mariana Strange, one of my favorite bands, because goodness knows that could be an easy mistake. The legend of Mariana's Web appears to get its name from the deepest part of the ocean, though, Mariana Trench. It's apparently the deepest part of the dark web, a forbidden place of mysterious evil. Uh, maybe. Depending on where you get your Mariana's Web myths, it's where you'll find the darkest secrets humanity has in its history. The secret location of Atlantis and the Vatican secret archives, or a database of archives belonging to the most powerful intelligence agencies on Earth. Now, if any of those titles sound familiar, I would recommend checking out some of the other content we put out here 
here, since that's the type of stuff I like to talk about. But here's the thing Mariana's web is the definition of spooky BS, especially because it's technically impossible. It's supposedly only accessible through quantum computers, which really only exist in science fiction. This is once again where the legend part of today's title comes into play. But let me know in the comments if you think it exists, since honestly, I wish it would. It would make my life a heck of a lot easier if I could hack into the Vatican archives and get the answers we all deserve. Coming in at number five, we have the expressionless. According to this very bizarre legend, a nameless woman arrived at the Cedar Sinai Hospital back in June of 1972 wearing a bloodied white gown. Now, what set this woman apart from the rest of the patients in the hospital was that she had a mannequin like appearance, yet moved fluently like any normal person. Her face was devoid of facial features, and on top of all of that, the woman had a kitten inside of her mouth, which she pulled out before collapsing to the ground. Now, she was quickly rushed into a room and prepped for sedation, with the staff opting to restrain her just in case. However, when they attempted to inject her, the woman immediately fought back. She then rose from the bed and revealed razor sharp teeth that were seemingly impossible to fit into her mouth. She then attacked one of the doctors, sinking her teeth firmly into his neck, killing him quickly. When authorities arrived, they couldn't restrain her, with the woman killing everyone in the hospital, with only one nurse surviving the onslaught, dubbing the woman the expressionless. Since that day, there has never been a sighting of her, perhaps because she isn't real. What I don't understand is why she had a kitten in her mouth. That is the most bizarre part of the entire thing. Now, the origin behind this legend, it was uploaded on the internet, appearing on Creepypasta back in June of 2012. Coming in at number four, we have Lavender Town Syndrome. This is a popular urban legend amongst gamers, specifically those who played Pokemon Red and Green in Japan. This legend began back in 1996 when there was an apparent peak in suicides and sickness in folks between the ages of 7 to 12 years old. Rumors began to spread that illness occurred in children who reached Lavender Town in Pokemon, with it being said that the town's theme music had extremely high pitched frequencies that may have resulted in folks becoming sick or even taking their own lives. Due to this frequency, it is said that around 200 people took their own lives or developed illnesses and afflictions, with some complaining of severe headaches after listening to the music. The mass hysteria ultimately resulted in the programmers fixing the music to be at a lower frequency, and since then, no complaints have been made. In Pokemon Gold, Silver, and Crystal, the Lavender Town music was recomposed altogether to be happier, and the Pokemon Tower was demolished and replaced with the Kanto Radio Tower. The Lavender Town theme was also re recorded for the 2017 Pokemon Go Halloween event. Coming in at number three, we have the Candyman. The Candyman was an urban legend based off of a short story by Clive Barker, which eventually got turned into a movie. Basically, legend states that if you look in the mirror and chant his name five times, then you will summon him and he will appear in the mirror. Similar to, you know, Bloody Mary. The movie and legend scared many when they found out something similar happened to a woman. In 1987, a woman named Ruth McCoy was found dead after two men climbed through her medicine cabinet and shot her. The film was inspired by the method of killing and incorporated that into the film. In the film, you see the man with a hook appear through the medicine cabinet slash mirror and try to slash people to death. Ruth's death had a lot of people scared. When Candyman featured the medicine cabinet scene in their film, it made them even more scared making people think that, oh damn, killers can enter my house through the connecting wall and through the medicine cabinet. Not only that, but this whole thing had people believing that the Candyman was real. In our second spot, we have Alligators in the Sewers. The 1980 horror sci-fi movie Alligators in the Sewers is about a flushed away alligator that turns into this massive mutant gator. In the film, the gator gets flushed and ends up living in the sewers. From there, it eats the bodies of small animals. But these animals have been used for scientific experiments, and by eating them, it caused the gator to grow into this massive creature. Then it starts terrorizing the city. Of course, there is an urban legend very similar to the movie. It's probably what the movie was inspired by. Legend goes that a New York couple brought back baby alligators while vacationing in Florida. Eventually, they flushed these gators down the toilet and the gators made a family of their own in the sewers under the city. Then legend goes that one time a boy was reaching for his baseball that rolled into the sewer grate and an alligator bit off his arm. Now, let's look at the facts here. This legend and movie had people really believing that alligators could survive in sewers. But here's the thing, alligators are cold-blooded animals, meaning they can't regulate their own body temperature. In order for them to survive, they need to warm their bodies by the hot sun or a heat lamp. 
And I mean, I don't think there are heat lamps down there in the sewers, okay? And there's definitely no exposure to sunlight. Without the warmth of the sun, the alligators would eventually die. Also, New York winters can be pretty harsh. They would end up just freezing to death down there. Now, if for some reason they did survive, the polluted water would certainly kill them off. They can't live long in salmonella or E. coli, which is found in the sewage. And in our number one spot, we have The Dead Man's Curve. This 1998 film starring Matthew Lillard, who I love, is about two college students who discover that if their roommate takes his own life, then the college will bump up their grades out of sympathy. So they plan to kill their roommate and make it look like a Hate to break it to you, but I don't think colleges are allowed to do that. Either way, this movie gave birth to this urban legend. People really thought that a death could get them straight A's. Other versions of the legend say that the roommate doesn't have to commit suicide, but the school will grant them good grades if their roommate is murdered, or if they suffered from an illness and then they died as a result of that. Another variation says that the death must occur in the room or with the roommate. And a student who does not witness his roommate's death only receives a 3.4 average. Honestly, either way, it's just pretty messed up. But it had a lot of people thinking that it was real. Hate to break it to you, but it's not. So keep on studying and earn your grades that way. Coming in at number five, we have the Night Marchers. The Huaka Ipo, also known as the Night Marchers, are murderous shades, demons, and revenants that haunt the islands. These undead spirits are the fighters, heroes, and warriors of ancient Hawaii, who are well known throughout the Hawaiian legends. These warriors are believed to be eternally fated to march the islands, seeking their next battle. They're most active at night but also have been reported to be seen during the day. No structure deters their path and as a result they're often seen walking right through buildings. Some think that these restless souls are looking to reclaim rightful territory, replay a battle gone awry or avenge their own deaths. While others say that night marchers are searching methodically for an entrance into the next world. Night marchers are said to roam through very specific locations and are often recognized by their raised torches and repeated chants. Although there have have been a few scattered reports of daytime marches. Moreover, the night marches are thought to come out during periods of heavy wind, rain and high surf, and fog or mist often accompanies them on their journey. It is also thought that the night marches appear on certain nights designated by the moon, including Poakua, the 14th night of the new moon, and the nights of Kane, Ku, Lono, and Kanaloa. Although the night marches allegedly float a few inches off the ground, some local accounts tell of seeing mysterious footprints in their path after they have passed. But where there was legend has it that resting your eyes upon the night marchers could signal a grim fate for the perpetrator, a friend or a relative, so witnesses are urged to crouch low to the ground, freeze and don't look into their eyes. Any sound or movement could invite a night marcher's deadly glance. These night marchers are set diligently upon their destination and are not considered spirits that will deviate from their path to haunt humans nearby. Therefore you must also be perfectly silent and still for any sudden sound or movement could invite the deadly glance of a night marcher. If you make eye contact with the night marchers, you will die and be forced to march with them for an eternity. Coming in at number four, we have Haunted Pei Highway. Pei Highway is known as a historic site and urban legend attached to it. The highway runs through the district of Nuuanu, a valley between the Koalau mountain range on Leeward, Oahu, and it was there that this decisive battle unfolded. Hundreds of warriors fought in the battle. Years later, during the initial development of what would eventually become the Pali highway, more than 800 human remains were recovered. Some believe that the spirits of those warriors continue to haunt the area. Pali Highway is a staple of local urban legends and a popular spot for paranormal activity. People report coming back with photos of orbs or white mist or stories of supernatural encounters. One of the most common stories associated with the highway warns people not to take pork over the Pali. This is because it is known that if you try to bring pork across, your car will stop at some point along the journey and an old woman with a dog will appear. To continue on your way, you must feed the pork to the dog. While another story about the area describes two large stones at the start of the Pali Trail. These stones, according to the legends, were considered goddesses who took the form of these stone sentries to guard the Pali. Travelers would leave offerings in exchange for safe passage and women would bury the umbilical cords of their newborns as protection from evil spirits. In at number three, we have the disappearance of Ashley, Kansas. 
Now this is a bizarre urban legend but one of my favourites on this entire list. It is said that back in 1952 an anomalous incident occurred in the town of Ashley, Kansas. However it should be noted that this isn't nor has ever been a real place. Sorry to burst your bubble. However the legend states that back in 1952 an earthquake occurred in the middle of the night resulting in strange happenings. Specifically the town of Ashley, Kansas abruptly disappearing. When police went to investigate they found nothing only a smoldering burning fissure. It was said that the 679 residents of the town were missing, however the search for them was called off after 12 days of searching. The legend also goes on to state that not long after, yet another earthquake occurred. And this time when the police went to investigate, the burning fissure was gone and the town was still nowhere to be seen. And that is all that is known about Ashley, Kansas, the town that supposedly disappeared overnight. Coming in at number 2 we have Slenderman. To quote the original Slenderman post on something awful, we didn't want to go, we didn't want to kill them, but it's persistent silence and outstretched arms horrified and comforted us at the same time. This is perhaps the most popular modern day legend on our list, with it crossing over into the mainstream with games and movies being made about this supernatural figure. Now Slenderman originated as a creepypasta internet meme created by something awful forums user Eric Knudsen back in 2009. Slender is described as being in incredibly tall, somewhere between 7 to 9 feet, as well as pale in complexion with an emaciated figure. He is sometimes portrayed with incomplete features such as empty eye sockets. He is also said to possess a handful of supernatural powers and abilities. He is said to be immortal, having lived for around 11,000 years without end, and any wounds inflicted on him instantly heal. Now stories told about the supernatural character commonly feature him stalking, abducting or traumatizing children. Now outside of the internet, he has become an icon. On, with a prominent influence in popular culture, with video games being made about the figure including Slender the 8 Pages and Slender the Arrival. However things became very real with this legend back in 2014 when two girls attacked another girl and claimed to the courts that they did it for Slenderman, which is absolutely terrifying. And finally coming in at number 1 we have the Russian sleep experiment. This urban legend emerged a few years back in 2010, so sorry to disappoint in advance but this one is certainly not real, but that doesn't stop folks from speculating. Now, now the legend itself recounts a supposed experiment that took place in the late 1940s in a Soviet test facility. According to the legend, five prisoners were kept in a sealed gas chamber with a continually administered airborne stimulant which kept them awake for 30 consecutive days. Now the prisoners volunteered for the experiment under the false promise that they would be released after the 30 days. For the first few days of the experiment, the prisoners behaved normally, chatting with one another and even talking to researchers through the one way glass. However, over the subsequent days things quickly turned much darker. After 9 days one of the prisoners began screaming uncontrollably for hours on end, while the other prisoner seemingly had no reaction to the odd outburst. The man ultimately screamed for so long that his vocal cords burst, which makes me feel physically sick. I know this isn't real but the idea of that happening is disgusting. Not long after a second prisoner began screaming, while the others prevented the researchers from looking in by pasting torn book pages to the windows with their own feces. A few more days passed and things went silent and after 15 days the researchers decided to turn off the stimulant and enter the room. What they found was absolutely disgusting. One of the prisoners was deceased and the four remaining survivors had performed severe mutilation on themselves, tearing off their own flesh and removing their own organs. Coming in at number 5 we've got the Magallan Monster. If you've ever taken a drive up the 87 you might have come across a set of very colourful very large footprints tracked across the highway. Wow. While these particular prints were put there by people, they are in homage to the Magallan Monster aka Arizona's answer to Bigfoot. This big beastie lives along the Magallan Rim and has been seen from Prescott all the way to Clifton. Sightings of the monster date back to early as 1903 with plenty of reports of video, tracks and hair samples appearing since. People claim that the Magallan Monster is a bipedal humanoid towering over most at 7 feet tall leaving behind 22 inch footprints. Like most ape-like beasts in the woods, it has crazy strength and some wild eyes. Some claim it's covered in long black hair, others say it's reddish brown. Maybe it changes with the seasons, or maybe there's more than one. The Magallan monster is also known for smelling really, really bad. Like dead fish, skunk, B.O., peat moss, and snapping turtle musk. I'd hide out in the woods if I smelled like that too. Part of the reason why it's so rarely sighted is that it tends to be active at night. It will hunt and gather all sorts of different foods under cover of darkness and make little nests for itself. You stumble across one of these pine needle refuges, get the hell out of there. This beefy monster is known to be very territorial and very violent. 
It reportedly likes to decapitate deer and other wildlife before digging in, and if it can pull the dome off a deer, it can pop your top off like a bottle of coke. Be careful if you hear any weird noises too, because the Magallan monster likes to mimic other wildlife. Birds, coyotes, it is even reported to shriek like a woman in distress. So don't go running off to save the damsel because you might find yourself face to face with a very hairy hunter. Tie up your supplies if you're camping too, as the monster will rummage through stuff left out. You know, they were all about the hairy man or the wild man or something like that. And of course I didn't believe them. This, says Wade, is a small baby Bigfoot trying to hide in the corner from his night vision camera. Coming in at number four, we've got El Chupacabra. Ah, the Southwest classic. Such a strange creature, the Chupacabra. Is it an alien? A demon dog? Something else? Also known as the goat sucker, these cryptids love to feed on livestock, attacking in the night. Farmers and other animal owners have often found these creatures totally hollowed out following particularly dark nights. Common features of the Chupacabra attacks are a complete lack of blood and puncture wounds in the neck and hindquarters. The wounds are always super clean, no signs of struggle or messiness. Sometimes there are weird injuries too. Cattles often have their anuses cored out and somehow even with these brutal injuries no blood is found. Do the goat suckers inject some sort of sedative? Do they have magical powers? We may never know. One theory is that they have wings and descend on their prey and drain them before they have time to react. This would also explain the lack of tracks that accompany chupacabra attacks. Although, if they were so quick and clever, wouldn't they also attack humans? Maybe our blood just doesn't taste as good. Now, this legend didn't start in Arizona, but now it's quite prevalent. El Chupacabra seems to have originated in Puerto Rico and made its way into Latin America, eventually spreading to the southwestern states. Now you'd be hard pressed to find an Arizonan without some sort of chupacabra story. Tucson resident Billy Nubian claims that he saw one attacking his goats late one night. He was startled awake by the panic sounds of his goats bleeding. Running outside to investigate, he saw a huge rat-like creature pinning one of his goats. It then turned to face Billy, let out a blood-curdling scream, and ran off into the dark. Sarah A. has a similar story where she encountered a half-man, half-ape creature crouching frog-style in her yard. Freaky. In at number three, we have the Menehune. According to Hawaiian oral traditions, the Menehune were an ancient race of Polynesian people who inhabited the Hawaiian Islands before the first voyages arrived. While there are no written accounts or skeletal remains of the Menehune, many Hawaiian legends reference them as mythical people of small stature and great strength. According to mythology, Menehune lived deep in the forests of Kauai and other Hawaiian islands. The Menehune are a mischievous group of small people who roamed the deep forest at night and are said to be about two feet tall, though some were as tiny as 6 inches, small enough to fit in the palm of a hand. They enjoy dancing, singing and archery, and their favourite foods are bananas and fish. According to local legend, these small creatures are extremely industrious, master builders who are able to use their massive strength to accomplish great feats of construction and engineering in a matter of hours. The Menehune worked at night so ancient Hawaiians would not discover them. Their work would be abandoned if they were caught. Legend has it that the Menehune were capable of completing major projects in a single night. And they are credited with the construction of the Elacoco fish pond. Though referred to as the Menehune fish pond, archaeologists believe the site was constructed 1,000 years ago and that the stones used in its construction came from more than 25 miles away. If not credited to be built by the Menehune, its construction is a mystery. Another structure with mysterious Menehune ties on Kauai is the Kikiola Irrigation Ditch, located in Waimea. While ancient Hawaiians are known for their stone crafted irrigation systems for growing taro, the Menehune Ditch is a fascinating archaeological find because of the type and cut of stone used to create it. Instead of uncut or roughly shaped lava rock, the Menehune ditch is constructed of finely carved basalt stones. In addition to their handiwork, the Menehune have been known to use magic arrows to pierce the heart of angry people, igniting feelings of love instead. They also enjoy cliff diving and according to local lore, they were smart, extremely strong and excellent craftsmen, though because they worked at night, they were rarely seen by human eyes. Coming in at number 2, we have the Green Lady. By day, the Wahiawa Botanical Garden is a beautiful destination for those wanting to see lush tropical flora. Nearby, however, is home to a legend of a much more ghastly sight. If you decide to peer down into the nearby gulch at twilight, you may just see a glimpse of the local legendary Obake or Ghost, the Green Lady of Wahiawa. The story of the Green Lady takes place in the Wahiawa Botanical Garden, where one day, while taking a shortcut through the nearby garden, the woman became separated from one of her children in the dense and dark forest. Unable to find her child, she lost her life 
survive of heartbreak and disappeared. Now she wanders the area and is said to snatch people that she finds playing in the garden and forest in an attempt to replace her own lost family. Reports of the green lady describes her as a monstrous woman with green tinted skin. Her clothing and long black hair are covered in moss and seaweed and her approach is heralded by the stench of the decaying plant matter that covers her. There have been sightings of a green woman in the forest and the last known sighting was in the 1980s. People in Wahia sometimes dare each other to run across the bridge as the story says that the green lady will come up on the bridge to take people away. The ghost has even been seen on the outskirts of Waihiawa Elementary School which is located on the edge of the gulch. And finally in and one we have Pele's Curse. Moving towards one of the most known urban legends of Hawaii we have Pele's Curse. Pele is known as the Hawaiian goddess of fire, lightning, wind, dance and volcanoes. Her home is believed to be on the Halamaumau crater at the summit of the Kalauea volcano. Pele is often portrayed as a wanderer and sightings of the familiar and popular goddess have been reported throughout the island chain for hundreds of years, but especially near volcanic craters and near the home of Kalauea, one of the most active volcanoes in the world. In these sightings she appears as a very tall beautiful young woman or an unattractive and frail elderly woman, usually accompanied by a white dog. Those well versed in the legend say that Pele takes this form of an elderly beggar woman to test people, asking them if they have food or drink to share. Those who are generous and share with her are rewarded, while anyone who is greedy or unkind is punished with their homes or other valuables destroyed. She is known for her passion and temper, with many visitors reporting hearing stories of her power and destruction. The legend of Pele's curse says that anyone who removes anything natively Hawaiian, like pieces of rock or sand from the Hawaiian islands, will feel the wrath of Pele, who views the rocks as her children. Legend has it that if you take from Pele, you will incur years of bad luck. It is said that Pele's wrath is stimulated by jealousy or arrogance. Some believe the myth of Pele's curse was actually invented by park rangers on the big island of Hawaii because they were tired of visitors making off with bits of the island. Many people, including local residents, believe that Pele's curse is just a legend. However, to this day, hundreds of pieces of lava rock are mailed back to the big island as a result of those who claim they have experienced bad luck and misfortune due to the curse they received when stealing from the island. Coming in at number 5 is the ghost of Stowe Lake. The history of Stowe Lake, located in the Golden Gate Park in San Francisco, is shrouded in mystery. Stowe Lake is said to be haunted by the spirit of a woman who, after attempting to save her child who fell in the water, drowned in the lake. Now legend goes that this woman, referred to as the White Lady, so was the White Lady, wanders the edges of Stowe Lake as she searches for her baby. It is said that she can even be summoned by visitors, with the most active area surrounding the lake being near the Pioneer Women and Children statue. The legend states that the statue, depicting a woman with children, houses the spirit that haunts Stowe Lake. People have noted that at night the statue seems to have three children surrounding her instead of two, two older ones and one that is barely a toddler. Anyone wishing to summon the White Lady can do so by calling out, White Lady, White Lady, I have your baby three times, which seems very cruel if you ask me. Now if she believes you, the woman will appear before you and will ask for her baby back. However, for doing this, the woman will haunt you for the rest of your life. However, if you tell the woman you don't have her baby, legend says she will drag you into Stowe Lake and give you the same death she suffered. It is also noted that the White Lady of Stowe Lake is not the only ghost to be found residing in San Francisco, of course, and if you wish to explore the creepy haunted history, you can do so with Haunted San Fran Ghost Tour. Coming in at number 4 we have the Dark Watchers. The Dark Watchers is a name given to a group of entities in California folklore purportedly seen observing travellers along the Santa Lucia Mountains. The Dark Watchers are said to be tall, sometimes giant sized featureless dark silhouettes often adorned with brimmed hats or walking sticks. They are phantoms that are said to lurk inside the eerie mountains. Legend has it that the Dark Watchers have claimed to be seen staring out at the vast space below the mountains before completely vanishing. Now this legend may be attributed to the Chumash people who historically inhabited the central and southern coastal regions of California, with the ghostly figures first appearing in their Indian history and lore. The cave walls were donned with drawings by the Chumash that depicted these phantoms. John Steinbeck also went on to write about the Dark Watchers in his story Flight, where the creatures were described as dark forms against the sky. I quote, Pebe looked suspiciously back every time or so, and his eyes sought the tops of the ridges ahead. Once on a white barren spur, he saw a black figure for a moment, but he looked quickly away, for it was one of the Dark Watchers. No one knew who the Watchers were, nor where they lived, but it was better to ignore them and never to show interest in them. 
They did not bother one who stayed on the trail and minded his own business. Steinbeck's son, Thomas Steinbeck, would also grow up to report having seen the Dark Watchers during his childhood, and later along with artist Benjamin Brode, collaborated on a book titled In Search of the Dark Watchers, where they go into the history of the legend and interview locals who claim to have seen them, such as the famed Big Sur resident Billy Post. In more recent history, sightings occurred in the 1960s by a Monterey High School principal. Coming in at number three, we've got Skinwalkers. These Navajo legends Legends have been cited all over, but have quite a reputation in Arizona. Medicine men, possessed by spirits, having to choose between good and evil. Often hermits, being exiled from their communities. They take the forms of many animals and travel through the wastes. If driving through the arid desert at night wasn't unsettling enough, just wait until you hear about what skinwalkers like to do. Often they'll travel alongside lone vehicles in the dark, even when the car is huffing it. They'll tap on the windows of the vehicle, trying to get the driver's attention. If the driver stops to see what's going on and gets out of their car, it's not likely that they're coming back. Yikes. There are some hot spots that locals try to avoid at night. Apparently there's a ranch that has been given the name Skinwalker Ranch, thanks to the huge amounts of reports made. And San Carlos Reservation is also a place most will warn you away from during the night. Although, most forests at night have their fair share of spooky denizens. There's one tale of a man camping alone that really makes you question whether a little adventure is worth it or not. He was hiking along with his dog and found an empty cave to set up camp in. As he unpacked his stuff, he noticed some unsettling cave paintings along the walls. Later that same night, he was woken up by his dog ferociously barking Working. As he sat up to see what was the matter, he saw a malformed creature slinking near the entrance of the cave. Acting quickly, he shot at it with his rifle, but this only stunned the creature. It called out to him, saying that it wanted to help. Sure. At this point, the man grabbed his dog and hightailed it out of there, leaving all his stuff. He hasn't gone back since. Hopefully, he didn't leave anything too valuable behind, although he did escape with his dog and his life, which are valuable enough. Coming in at number two, we've got the Haunted Antique Mall. Back to Tucson, for more terror and troubles, there's an old two-story furniture store that was converted into an antique mall of sorts. You know the kind, set up like a flea market with all sorts of independent booths selling their wares. Well, one day, customers were walking around upstairs looking at the assorted antiques, and they heard some clicking noises. One particularly curious antiquer decided to investigate and found the source, an old typewriter. The thing is, no one was around to operate it. The customers who had heard the typing were the only people upstairs. After that, more and more ghostly tales appeared. Furniture that was left neat and tidy at closing would be strewn throughout the aisles the next morning. Radios would increase in volume with no one around. Employees found themselves frozen in place from time to time, experiencing a distortion of time. They would be stuck there as customers passed by in fast or slow motion. Apparitions would appear all over, sometimes appearing as a grinning boy, other times as a mischievous looking teenager. Nobody knows who these wraiths belong to. After hearing loud crashing noises upstairs but finding nothing displaced, the owners decided it was time to close down the upper level. Now, considering that all sorts of people were bringing in antiques from different sources, it is possible that all these ghosts came from haunted objects. Or it could be that the furniture store itself is haunted. Nobody's come up with concrete proof of the hauntings, but if you ever find yourself antiquing in Tucson, watch out for paranormal activity. And finally at number one, the ghosts of Slaughterhouse Canyon. I mean, the name of this canyon should be enough to give into its bad news. Let me say it again. Slaughterhouse Canyon. Come on. The tale that accompanies the terrifying name comes from the gold rush back in the 1800s. A young family moved out to try their hand at striking it rich. However, this plan did not go very well. Soon, they were hungry and destitute. The father would often head out for days, searching for food to sustain him and his family. Tragically, one day he never returned. Without the father to keep them fed, the family slowly starved. As their bodies wasted away, so too did their minds. Eventually, the mother couldn't take it anymore. Her children's cries were too much for her to bear. She donned her wedding dress and ritualistically killed her children. Carrying the corpses down to the nearby river, she wept and screamed. After she dropped their bodies into the water, she wandered around until succumbing to starvation soon after. This sad story forever marred the reputation of Slaughterhouse Canyon. Now, if you visit at night, you might be able to hear the panned cries of the murderous mad mother. Tragic and terrifying. Number five on this list is hitting the elf. As far as the story with the elf on the shelf goes, if a child is to touch the elf on a shelf, then all of its magical abilities will leave, and the only way you can bring it back is to sprinkle cinnamon around it and leave it overnight. If you do that, then its magical abilities will return, and it will continue reporting to Santa Claus. However, there's a legend that if instead of touching the elf, you hit it or abuse it in some way, rather than lose its magical ability, 
you turn the elf into a force of evil. Similar to the legend of Krampus where he will punish you for being bad, this elf will do something similar if you abuse it and it labels you as a bad kid. Now that you're labeled as an especially bad kid and have harmed the elf, it will turn from a nice elf into an evil elf meant to make you pay for your actions. If you do this, then you can expect the elf to awaken in the night, except instead of reporting back to Santa Claus, it will enter your room and beat you the same way that you beat it. This will be an extended torture session from this now demonic elf whose only mission is to make you feel the pain that it felt. This process will occur every night right up until Christmas time when the elf will finally go away. However, that might mean that you could be getting tortured every evening by a demonic elf for weeks. Apparently, even if you try to kill this elf or send it away during the daytime when it should once again sit on your shelf, it will still come and find you in the night and be even angrier than it was before. Nobody knows how you can combat this thing if this ever was to happen to you. So the legend just further enforces that you shouldn't touch the elf on the shelf and if you do, then make sure you don't intentionally harm it in any way. Number four on this list is the tiny camera. The whole elf on a shelf thing has really taken off in the last few years with millions of tiny little elves being sold. It has also become one of the biggest trends come Christmas time and synonymous with the holiday itself. The whole nature of the elf on a shelf is to watch you in your home and make sure that you're good. We suspend our disbelief a little bit and believe that this little tiny elf doll comes to life and then reports that back to Santa. In one family's elf on a shelf though, this info wasn't going back to Santa Claus at all. In 2011, a family had an elf on the shelf for about three weeks before they noticed this wasn't just an innocent doll. Inside the elf was a tiny camera that was sending video to a feed. The camera was dead when they found it, but they have no idea how long it would have been running and recording them. This sparked a theory that the elf on a shelf is a method for big corporations to get inside our homes and learn more information about us. People have even gone further with this and theorized that it may be the government who's behind this and wants to have an extra eye on what's going on in the typical domestic lifestyle. It's also possible that in that one instance with the family, a creeper installed the camera and it was going to one select person. They never found out how the camera got there or who it was going to, so it's left it up in the air for people to speculate on. Having thousands of mini cameras installed in these tiny elves to watch us seems a little bit far-fetched to me, but we've seen the government or corporations do crazier things before. Coming in at number three, the monster of Elizabeth Lake. Now I should preface this point by saying that there are at least 10 different Elizabeth Lakes in California, but the one we're talking about today is in LA County near Palmdale, and is perhaps the oldest one in the state. Now it is said that Elizabeth Lake was created by the devil himself for the keeping of his hellish pets. The legend also goes on to state that if you swim deep enough, you will stumble across the passageway to hell. Throughout the years, there have been countless sightings of a monster that is said to have the neck of a giraffe, head of a bulldog, bat wings, and is said to be 50 feet long with a rancid scent of decay. For over a century, sightings have been reported and strike fear into the locals' hearts. It is said that locals have been so scared that landowners would actually sell or completely abandon their properties. Not to mention any attempt to build on the lake's land has come to no avail. At night, residents could hear screams from the lake and would have horribly disturbing visions. Farm animals would also disappear and sightings of flying winged creatures were also reported. However, like all urban legends, any proof of creatures' existence or death has yet to be discovered. Coming in at number two, the Turnbull Canyon Hauntings. Turnbull Canyon is a four mile loop located near Whittier, California and is part of Puente Hills Preserve. Turnbull is known for the view it provides of the Heisley Temple and Rose Hills Memorial Park. However, it has also been the source of rumors regarding paranormal activities. Death is said to reside within the canyon, the place itself once being referred to as Hutuknan, which means the place of the devil. The legend tells of the region being haunted by the Indians who were murdered for not converting to Catholicism. Their spirits are now said to linger in unrest in the canyon. Years later, Turnbull would also be the site of numerous satanic rituals held by cults attempting to conjure demons or even Satan himself, often by sacrificing children from the nearby orphanages. However, one day one of the sinister cults suddenly vanished and what was left behind in their wake were paranormal sightings and occurrences being reported by hikers and locals who have also claimed to have seen hooded figures, hellish creatures and mutilated children. Not to mention more mysterious deaths have since occurred, with one teenager being electrocuted while exploring the ruins by an old asylum in the canyon. A plane also crashed there in 1978, taking the lives of 29 people. And finally, coming in at number one, we have the Hollywood signed Spirit. Probably one of the most infamous 
infamous legends to come out of California is the Hollywood sign Spirit, which is said to be haunted by early 1900s actress Peg Entwistle. Entwistle was a British stage and screen actress who began her career back in 1925, appearing in several Broadway productions. By 1932, during the height of the Great Depression, Entwistle was in Los Angeles with a role in the Romney Brent play The Mad Hope, starring Billy Burke. Following that, Entwistle found her first and only credited film role for radio pictures called 13 Women. However, on September 18th, 1932, a woman was hiking below the Hollywood sign when she found a woman's shoe, purse, and jacket. She opened the purse and found a suicide note, after which she looked down the mountain and saw the body below. Entwistle's body remained unidentified until her uncle, with whom she had been living with, identified her remains. The suicide note was eventually published and read as follows. I am afraid. I am a coward. I am sorry for everything. If I had done this a long time ago, it would have saved a lot of pain. P.E. Nowadays, Entwistle is referred to as the Lady in White, who is said to appear to people hiking to the off-limits part of the sign, where she killed herself. However, as opposed to appearing as the beautiful actress she was, she is often seen with a skeletal face and deep, hollowed-out eyes. It is also said that if hikers are alone, the Lady in White will influence them to also plummet off the Hollywood sign. Coming in at five, Arkansas the Dog Boy. Now, the name may sound ridiculous, yes, but the story is truly chilling. If you find yourself at 65 Mulberry Street in the middle of a small Arkansas town of Quintman, you may very well encounter the hulking outline of a 300 pound half man half beast with glowing animal eyes. This is the dog boy. If you see him, walk quickly as he is rumored to chase people down the street, biting at their heels, just like a dog. Now, this legend is rare because the story behind the story may just be even creepier than the legend itself. Gerald Bettis, the only son of the Bettis family of 65 Mulberry, was reportedly a problem child, but not a cute one. No, this kid collected and tortured animals before turning his sociopathic focus to his parents, supposedly imprisoning them in their home and murdering his father. Bettis was eventually imprisoned for growing marijuana on his back porch and would later die in a state penitentiary in 1988 of a drug overdose. Spooky stuff. Coming in at four, Colorado, Riverdale Road. Riverdale Road near Thornton, Colorado is crammed with horrifying legends to bring even the bravest paranormal investigator to their knees. Riverdale Road is notorious for having some of the most chilling and endless ghost stories, beginning with the fact that it is literally referred to as the gates to hell. Yeah. Now, the gates themselves are simply made of rusty iron, yet people travel from far and wide to visit them. This is because the man who built the gates lost his mind once they were finished. He then burned his entire mansion with his family asleep inside. Worse still, he was never caught or put on trial. As of now, people report that a lady in white walks the road close by the gates, with many assuming she is the man's wife, wandering, searching for her murdered children or even her husband. Another ghostly story goes that there are accidents that specifically happen to joggers all the time. Once upon a time, a jogger decided to take a jog along Riverdale Road and ultimately got hit. They sadly passed away, and rumor has it their spirit now haunts the road. People who walk the road are said to have heard a loud heartbeat and footsteps. If you drive by, you might also feel something hitting your car when there's literally nothing there. Now, there are so, so many more stories, but we'll end with the Native American shapeshifters. Now, what makes Riverdale Road interesting isn't just the road itself, but because the area of land that it cuts through is also rumored to be haunted. For hundreds of years, there have been countless stories about Native American shapeshifters roaming the land, with many passers-by spotting them on the road. According to reports, they take on different shapes and communicate with people in their own ways. They're also known to play tricks on anyone who walks down Riverdale Road, so be warned. Number three on this list is Mormo. Mormo is the name given to one very particular elf on the shelf who is quite unlike the rest of them. Legend says that there is one elf that tries to impersonate an elf on the shelf and break into your home. This creature is a demon, though, whose only intentions are to kill. This legend started due to a brutal murder which took place a few years back. 
A wife and a husband had both been killed in a way that the police had an extremely hard time understanding. When the authorities got to the home and discovered the crime scene, there was blood everywhere and the couple was both lying in the middle of their living room. There was no signs of forced entry and nothing was taken though. The authorities thought that it might be a murder-suicide, however the manner of their death indicated that a third party was involved. One thing that stood out to the police was the blood spattered elf on a shelf positioned on the mantelpiece in full view of whatever it was that took place. The police were never able to determine the true cause of death, but this story sparked the legend of Mormo, the demon elf on the shelf. Now people believe that every time you get an elf on the shelf, you were simply rolling the dice and could end up with Mormo. If you do, then it's very possible that you and your family will die in a tragic and unexplained way before Christmas time. I'm not sure how much validity this has to it, kind of seems like somebody really ran with the story on this one, but having a devilish killer elf on the shelf like Chucky certainly isn't a pleasant thought. Number two on this list is that the entire Elf on a Shelf story was constructed by a demon. The entire premise behind the Elf on a Shelf is a little creepy to begin with. You're letting this magical little doll into your home to watch and judge your actions. Then when you're asleep, this doll gets up and flies back to Santa to let him make a final judgment on if you are good or bad. It's basically like a Christmas version of Big Brother. That being said though, we love Christmas and we love Santa so much that when we think about Santa, it doesn't seem so bad. But what if this elf on the shelf isn't reporting back to Santa at all? What if it was reporting back to a demon? In 2008, a woman who had an elf on the shelf started to notice little things missing from her home during the Christmas season. First it was her keys, then it was some of the kitchenware, and then some other more valuable items. She also started to notice that things started to go wrong. Appliances that were relatively new just stopped working. Leaks were happening in the home and the electricity kept going on and off. She had no idea what the catalyst of these problems could have been until she linked it to the elf on the shelf. They only started happening when she brought that thing into her home. Since then, other rumors have surfaced about people noticing things that are missing from their homes whilst having this little elf in their house. The story has snowballed to a place where there is now a community of people who swear these things aren't working for Santa at all, but actually for a mischievous demon. A demon who simply wants to wreck the Christmas season and cause chaos in your home. It should also be noted that the items and things that went wrong kept getting worse and worse the longer you kept that thing in your home. So who knows how bad things could get if you keep that thing in there for the entire season. Number one on this list is a devilish name. A rule associated with the elf on the shelf is that the family housing this elf must give it a name. Typically people go down the silly route and name it something like Mary Martha or Twinkle Toes or something ridiculous like that. All of that is fine and good and very in the Christmas spirit. However, there are a few names that you need to avoid when you're naming your elf on the shelf or you may run the risk of devilish possession. Names such as Lucifer, Bile, Gorgo, these names are all infernal names which are names that are linked to anti-hero figures used in satanic rituals. If you ever give your elf on the shelf an infernal name, and there's actually a full list of infernal names that you can look up if you want to double check, but if you do this, then you just open the door for your elf to become possessed by a demon. Just because the door is open doesn't mean that any demon will walk through it, however you don't really want to be giving them the option in the first place. Christmas time is a time of love and family and also to celebrate religion, all really nice things. If you are a demon though, this is one of the worst times of the year and you are itching to cause any type of chaos that you can and ruin the fun. If a demon takes over your elf on a shelf due to its name, then there's no limit to the amount of nastiness it could cause. Not only could this devilish puppet haunt your home, torture you in the night, or wreck your style of living, but now that a demon is in your home and possessing this elf, what's to say that it won't start trying to possess you? Also typically these elves leave a little bit after Christmas, but there's no timeline when it's possessed by a demon. That thing could stay and destroy your home and even your lives for however long it feels like. My advice is to stick to the silly when naming your elf on the shelf. In at five, ban death. This is quite a bizarre one that I'm honestly surprised I never heard of before. Supposedly in Korea, there is a genuine fear of fan death. Now, fan death is a well known belief in Korean culture where it is thought that if you have an electric fan running in a closed room with an unopened window, you will quite literally die. Now, of course, there is no definitive evidence to support this strange claim, yet it's still widely believed. Where this legend came from is unclear, but fears of electric 
fans date back to their introduction to Korea with stories existing in the 20s and 30s, warning the risks of nausea, asphyxiation, and facial paralysis to electric fans. Yeah, this is not a joke. Now you're probably asking yourself what the proposed cause of death actually are. Right? Well, first up is hypothermia, heat stress. Now, air movement will increase sweat evaporation, which cools the body, but in extreme heat, when the blown air is warmer than the body's temperature, it will increase the heat stress placed on the body and in turn causing heat exhaustion. Now, the EPA, aka the Environmental Protection Agency, discourages people from using fans in closed rooms without ventilation. However, they do approve of a fan if a window is open. Very strict fan rules here, guys. Now, the second proposed cause of death is asphyxiation. It is alleged that fans may cause asphyxiation by oxygen displacement and carbon dioxide intoxication. Honestly, I've spent my whole life using fans and I'm still here. I think, anyway. I don't know. In at four, red surgical mask. As most know, plastic surgery is quite a big deal in Korean culture, as it is in America and the rest of the world, with the pursuit of perfection a thing that most strive towards. So this legend goes, I quote, a man is sitting in an empty subway car when a tall, thin woman walks in and sits in front of him. Her hair is dark and long, it covers most of her face, but he can see that she has a red surgical mask on. Thinking nothing of it, he leans back and watches the door close. The man notices her eyes and she catches him staring. He smiles at her. She asks the man, Am I pretty? Taken aback, the man stammers, Yes. She takes her mask off, revealing the rest of her face. There was a gash from ear to ear, her gums, teeth, and ligaments showing. She screams at the man, Am I pretty now? In terror, the man tries to get her as far away from the woman as possible. She takes out a scalpel and makes her way to him when the doors open and the man runs out. Now, this legend may sound familiar to a lot of you, and that's because it shares very similar roots to Slip Mouthed Woman, a malevolent figure from Japanese folklore who partially covers her face with a mask or object and carries some sort of sharp instrument. According to popular legend, she asks potential victims if they find her attractive. If they respond no, she will kill them with her weapon. However, if they say yes, she will reveal that the corners of her mouth are slipped from ear to ear. Now, it's uncertain where the legend originated from, whether it was Japan or Korea, but regardless, it's straight up terrifying. Coming in at three, New Jersey, The Watcher. Now, this legend could honestly be the script for a horror movie. Let me break it down for you. A family begin receiving ominous notes just days after they close on their dream home. Yeah. Spooky, right? Well, this story took off back in 2015 after a young family moved into a million dollar house in Westfield, New Jersey. However, they began to get letters signed by someone only IDing themselves as the Watcher, who claimed it was their duty to watch over the house, while also spouting weird lines such as, I quote, do you need to fill the house with the young blood I requested? And who has the bedrooms facing the street? Yeah. Creepy. The writer also noted the make of the couple's car and the comings and goings of construction crews. He also observed that the couple had three young children, stating, I quote, Was your old house too small for the growing family, or was it greed to bring me your children? Once I know their names, I will call to them and draw them to me. Now, no one quite knows the truth behind the legend, whether it was a prank or a spooky neighbor, but what we do know is that the watcher was never caught and still remains watching the house in Westfield, New Jersey. Coming in at number two, California Turnbull Canyon. Turnbull Canyon is a four mile loop trail located near Whittier, California, and is part of Puente Hills Preserve. It lies in the northern central part of the preserve and is an east west canyon with relatively steep drainage. Now, natives call Turnbull Canyon Hatunga, or the place of the devil, and is supposedly where the ghosts of those slain for not converting to Christianity dwell alongside witches and Satanists who reportedly use the place to sacrifice children, whose spirits now walk along the canyon. According to other reports, Turnbull Canyon also houses the ghosts of 21 children who perished in a plane crash back in 1952. However, there are no existing records of the incident, so this may be local legend. However, what we do know is real is that in the canyon lies the remains of an old insane asylum that supposedly came came back to life to kill a teen in the 1960s via long dormant electrical wire. Not only that, but there are cults 
alien encounters and gravity hills. The list goes on and on. Basically, if something unnerves you, there is probably a story about it going down at Turnbull Canyon. Now, its origin is pretty simple. Turnbull's evil dates back centuries. However, it wasn't until the site was established as a fur trapping site in 1845 that things started to get a little odd. And very quickly, word of the canyon's evil terrors spread far and wide, making it one of the world's most visited places. But not for its beauty, but due to morbid curiosity. And finally, coming in at number one, Virginia, the Bunny Man Bridge. This terrifying urban legend originated from two incidents in Fairfax County, Virginia, in 1970, but very quickly spread through the Washington, D.C. area as well. Now, like all legends, there are many variations. Most involve a man wearing a rabbit costume who attacks people with an axe or a hatchet. Now, the legend goes that in 1904, a group of convicts were piled onto a bus to be transported from an asylum in Clifton, Virginia to a nearby prison. En route, however, one of the buses crashed and the convicts managed to escape. Thankfully though, the police were able to round up all of them. All but one. As their search went on, they began to find skinned, half-eaten bunnies in the woods and hanging from the overpass of Fairfax Bridge, now known as the Bunny Man Bridge. A year later, on Halloween night, several teens went to hang out under the bridge. Come morning, they were all found dead. Legend has it that if you hang out under the bridge on Halloween night, you will meet the same fate as the rabbits and the teenagers. Jump ahead to 1970, there were numerous police reports of people who had been threatened by a man holding an axe and wearing a white suit with bunny ears. Terrifying. A few other people also reported that the man in the suit threw an axe at them for trespassing near the bridge. To this day, there have been numerous reportings of the man with the axe, as well as the dead rabbits in the woods surrounding Fairfax Bridge, which is now known, once again, as the Bunny Man Bridge. Now, versions of the legend have varied over the years, particularly in the Bunny Man's name, motives, weapons, victims, and description, with some accounts stating that victims were mutilated and others that the Bunny Man is a ghost. However, that aside, the legend is absolutely horrifying and has prevented a lot of Virginia locals from wandering too close to the bridge. Starting us off at number five, we've got the Pied Piper. We all know the legend of the Pied Piper at this point. This legend slash fairy tale dates way back and has different regional variations. Some say that the flautist drew snakes away from a town, others say it was rats. In various versions of the stories, Mr. Pied Piper can be portrayed as generous, greedy, benevolent, or evil. It's all up to the storyteller. However, in Transylvania's version, he was a terrifying hypnotist. See, at some point, there was an abundance of rats in a small German town. The townsfolk didn't know what to do until the Pied Piper showed up. Using his bewitching tunes, he paraded the rats out of town, never to return. He came back to the village, expecting to be lauded as a hero and paid a sum of money, and neither of these things happened. He did his very best to convince the townsfolk that his services were worth their weight in gold, but they never did pay him. This made him quite upset. Leaving the town, he came up with a horrible revenge scheme. The next week, he returned, musical instrument in hand. This time, the goal was not rats or other pests. No, he wanted to lure away the town's children. And so he did, playing a new hypnotizing song that tugged at the hearts and minds of all the kids around. He once again paraded out of town, but this time with their future in tow. By the time all the adults realized what had happened, it was too late. What did the Pied Piper do with these children? Well, there are different theories. A particularly grim idea is that he led them all right off a cliff, like human lemmings. Yikes. Another less terrible one that'll link us to Transylvania is that he led them to a cave in the region and sealed it up. Eventually, the kids did escape and they settled in the Romanian countryside. Some say that's why you can find plenty of blonde-haired, blue-eyed German speakers in the area. Coming in at number four, we've got the Liar's Bridge. Oh, you're all in trouble. I see you down in the comments posting first like 10 comments deep and claiming that you don't like my shirts. I know fraud when I see it. Nobody better try to cross that bridge unless you're down to die. Okay, I'll elaborate. There's a bridge in Sibiu that has quite the reputation. It's said that anyone who lies while crossing it will cause it to collapse. That is serious. This legend has become so popular that many brides-to-be are required to declare their love and purity while crossing it. And if they're being dishonest, 
well. Of course, there's no way that the bridge would still be standing if this were really the case, as people love to lie. However, some have a less dramatic tale to tell, that the bridge will make certain noises upon the delivery of a lie, which could have something to it. The origins of the lying bridge are up in the air, but there are a few different explanations. Some claim that lying or adulterous spouses and fiancés would be tossed off the bridge if their impropriety was discovered. This would definitely explain the modern practices associated with the bridge. Others say that merchants who cheated their customers would be met with the same fate, overcharge or sell something under false pretenses and take a dip. It could also originate with tales of cadets coming to town, wooing local lasses, promising them the world and then disappearing forever. I would say that all these scenarios could result in a bridge famous for ending liars. Would you be willing to take a stroll across the footpath? Coming in at three, soul stealing dreams. Now this one is truly terrifying because not only does it involve your dreams but also your dead family members. It's f the legend goes that dreaming of a dead loved one is a bad omen, especially near water. It is said that the dead family member will call you towards them and if you embrace them in your dream they will steal your soul away. Lovely. One particular story occurred on a Korean TV show where they would discuss hauntings and encounters with the paranormal. I quote, During one of the episodes they had a family on where they talk about how their grandmother had passed away. The man said that he dreamt that his grandmother was beckoning him over while she was waiting deep in water. For some reason he didn't go when he told his wife. His wife explained that going into the arms of a dead person in water no less was a sure sign that your soul was going to be stolen. The husband said he kept having the same dream and every time he was closer and closer to the grandmother until one day the family realized that they had kept something of hers. They paid respects to her once more and the dream stopped. Lesson number one, if you're from Korea do not hang on to any of your deceased family members belongings. They will literally steal your soul for it. Coming in at 2, the virgin ghost. Stories of virginal ghosts are everywhere in Korea. They're often found in abandoned buildings, but more typically they're found in hospitals, schools, bathrooms, cemeteries and wooded areas. Just don't go to these places and you're cool, I guess. Now, these virgin ghosts almost always have long hair covering their faces and dressed in white garbs. This is due to the fact that tradition stated that single women should always wear their hair up and the white garb is usually worn during death. In Confucian Korean tradition, it was a woman's role to serve her father, husband and sons. If she died before being able to fulfill this goal, she would be cursed to walk the earth for eternity. Now legend goes that when you're in the presence of a virgin ghost, you will know it. This is because you will feel a sudden change in temperature perhaps a sudden chill, and the wind will often change direction. One story goes that, I quote, A man was living on the topmost floor of the apartment building. One late night, he heard someone knocking on his door. He did not find anyone at the door, but he heard a voice telling him to count to 100 with his eyes closed and without making any noise. He started counting, but got curious at 49. He opened his eyes and found a virgin ghost staring at him. It is said that virgin ghosts are most likely to be found in abandoned buildings. They are dressed in white and have long hair. Very spooky indeed. And finally, in at number one, the haunted bathroom. Now, for some very strange reason, Koreans have a lot, and I mean a lot, of stories about haunted schools, particularly haunted school bathrooms. Yeah, it's unsettling. But to be fair, Korean schools are definitely eerie. What with their dark stairwells and long hallways, they seem to be never ending. And of course, the creepy, oftentimes half lit fluorescent lights enter Korean school bathrooms, which in pop culture are often depicted as decrepit, old, crumbling, and all is dark. Now legend has it that one of these stalls in these bathrooms, particularly the stall located towards the back, is where a girl killed herself and supposedly now haunts it. Students whisper that the toilet flushes by itself and that the door will close with no wind around. Rumor has it that if you're alone in the bathroom you can hear the crying. Some also state that you can often see her watching you from inside the mirror. Another legend from a similar vein talks of a ghost that emerges from the toilet and asks you if you will use red or blue toilet paper. Honestly, neither. We all use white, right? If you choose red, the ghost will cut you open. If you choose blue, the ghost will choke you to death leaving your body blue from suffocation. So lose lose no matter what. In at 5, the witch girl of Pilot's Knob. Now this legend comes to us from Marion, Kentucky, where a young girl is said to be buried in a concrete grave. Back in 1916, a woman named Mary Louise Ford and her 5 year old daughter Mary Ellen Ford were living in Pilot's Knob. The mother and daughter were accused of being witches and instead of waiting for the trial, the frightened villagers dragged the mother and daughter out of the house and burned them alive at the stake. 
Jake, classic witch business. They then buried the mother's body in a different location, and to avoid the young girl coming back from the dead and seeking revenge, the fearful villagers made sure to take precautions. They buried the daughter in Pilot's Knob in a steel reinforced coffin, and then after lowering it into the grave, they filled it with concrete. Following that, they put gravel on top and built a metal fence all around the gravesite. Yeah, they were pretty damn scared. According to legend, the young girl's ghost paces back and forth behind the fence, searching for her mother who was buried somewhere else. Yet she cannot escape the confines of the fence. Many locals have even reported seeing tiny child's footprints in the gravel over her grave, and some believe that if you visit the girl's grave alone and get too close, her hands will come up and grab a hold of you and drag you down into the concrete. Folks who have reported to see her go say that she wears a white dress that is scorched at the bottom and her long blonde hair smolders at the ends. In at 4 The Hanging Man of Allendale Train Tunnel The Allendale Train Tunnel is located south of Cincinnati in the woods behind the Allendale Trailer Park in Ellesmere, Kentucky. Now legend goes that some years ago a man hung himself from a hook that is set above the tunnel entrance. The man's ghost is said to walk the tunnel or even appear hanging from the hook. Not only that, but there are also reports of disembodied voices as well as screams coming from inside the tunnel. Now, for those seeking to locate the tunnel, there has been some confusion simply because it's known as a train tunnel, yet no trains run through it. It's actually a tunnel for the stream that runs under the tracks. In order to reach it, you must enter the woods, travel down a hill, and follow the stream to reach the tunnel, which is now heavily graffitied and littered. Although in urban legend, one element rings true there is a hook hook above the entrance to the tunnel, the clear indicator that you're in the right place. Enjoy. Coming in at number three, we've got Bao Bao. It really does seem that every culture has their own version of the boogeyman. I suppose parents got really fed up with their young children, eh? Something we can all relate to. Bao Bao is exactly that, a Romanian boogeyman. However, I find this figure to be even scarier than lots of the other children snatchers. See, the Bao Bao stays in the same home as the kids. This cloaked figure is believed to appear whenever children misbehave and is always waiting for his chance from a hiding place somewhere in the house. Sometimes it's the broom closet, other times it's the storeroom. Either way, I bet this knowledge scared the daylights out of a bunch of Transylvanian kids. Imagine playing around and coming face to face with the door concealing a mysterious man who will take you away for acting up. With this knowledge, I bet kids were actually quite well behaved. Unlike boogeymen in other cultures, the kidnappings also only last for a little while. The Bao Bao will grab disobedient kids and hold on to them for a year. So you don't immediately get turned into soup or drowned in a river, but instead you have to live with this terrifying man for 365 give or take. No friends, no family, no good food, just hard work and a scary supervisor. If anyone did get taken away, it probably scarred them for life. After the year, they get returned home and I'm sure their lives are never the same. Coming in at number two, we've got the ghosts of Teleki Mansion. Here we go, some real Transylvanian ghost stories. The region is known for its beautiful architecture and castles, so there's no surprise that all sorts of ghastly tales are attached to the ornate buildings. Unfortunately, Dracula's castle is Bram Stoker's invention and doesn't really exist. But there are plenty more spooky facades from where that came from. One such tale originates in the Teleki Mansion. This rundown and abandoned building was once an extravagant abode, but these days most locals do their best to avoid it. It's actually relatively close to the university town of Cluj-Napoca, in a smaller town called Okna Murs. Legend says this mansion is haunted by the drunken ghosts of soldiers. During the Second World War, a squad of soldiers broke into the mansion. They'd heard that there was plenty of good wine in the cellars and decided it would be a good night to imbibe. After Locating the gigantic barrels, they had themselves a grand old time. As soldiers tend to do when given downtime with lots of alcohol, they got drunk. A little too drunk, probably. I say this because they ended up goofing around with their guns and firing them inside of the mansion. After causing a mess and a half, one unlucky marksman hit an unintended target. His bullet pierced one of the gigantic barrels, which started to flood the cellar. In all likelihood, a couple of barrels were probably punctured. Gallons and gallons of wine rushed into the underground room, drowning the soldiers before they could escape. I suppose that's as good a way to go as any, drowning in wine. Although I think the soldiers might have enjoyed it a little bit more uh, if it was 
in their bellies rather than their lungs. And finally, at number one, we've got people eating lakes. Sorry to all you Great Lakes swimmers out there, the Transylvanian bodies of water tend to be a little more aggressive than others. Of course, they don't actually eat people, but they drown enough experienced swimmers that folks started to claim that they had an appetite. One such lake is Lake Vindrell, which is known for devouring even the most skillful of swimmers. Remember folks, don't eat before going swimming, always have a buddy, and try to avoid voracious waterways. If the disappearances of swimmers wasn't enough, locals have also been known to find bloody chunks of people floating around. That doesn't usually happen when somebody drowns, right? Another lake famous for consuming is Lezer Lake. Apparently this oversized puddle once drowned an entire town. Something gave way, causing the lake to flood in and envelop everything. Neighboring towns thought the church was celebrating something based on all the noise the bells were making, but nope, the bells were ringing because the church was literally descending under the water. So yeah, you better watch your back around those Transylvanian lakes. They'll grab you before you can say backstroke. Count me in at number five, ghost taxi. Back in 2011, Japan was struck by a 9.0 to 9.1 magnitude earthquake. It was the most powerful earthquake ever recorded in Japan and the fourth most powerful earthquake in the world since modern record keeping began in 1900. The earthquake triggered powerful tsunami waves that may have reached heights up to 40.5 meters, which is absolutely terrifying. Now, a few years after this, this catastrophic event, stories of ghosts, specifically ghost taxis, began circulating in areas that were directly affected by the tsunami. However, this isn't new. According to reports, many Tokyoites have been telling stories about spectral passengers since way back when. One common legend is of pedestrians hailing down taxis and asking to be taken to a Yama cemetery. When they arrive, the driver tells them the price and turns around to collect the fare, but there's no one in the back seat. Very spooky. Now, this legend may have some merit. As it turns out, the open of the Chiada line in the late 1960s brought on some interesting problems as it ran directly under the cemetery. Now the legend goes that some of these souls got lost on the trains and they're attempting to get back home via these ghost taxis. It's actually pretty sad. Coming in at number four, the Regina of Akasaka Road. This is a legend popular among students who have taken a history class nearby Sophia University. Kino Kunai Saka is a hill running past Akasaka Palace towards Akasaka stations and serves as the setting for this dark and haunting legend. I quote, a man hears wailing while walking down the slope at night and sees a beautiful girl, dressed as if she is from a wealthy family, weeping on the banks of the moat. The man stops to ask her if she's okay and to console her, but the girl continues to weep while hiding her face behind one of the long sleeves of her kimono. While he keeps on bleeding with the girl to stop crying, she slowly rises up with her back turned to him and then turns towards him and wipes her face with her hands, as if to wipe away tears. But it turns out she has no face, just a blank slate where I eyes, nose and mouth should be. The man screams in fear and runs up the hill as fast as he can, away from the scene, not stopping to look back. He spots a lantern far up the road. Exalted, he runs towards it, although it turns out to be a lonely sober cellar rather than a dwelling. Upon reaching the cellar, he drops to the floor and breathlessly tries to explain what he just saw. The sober cellar replies, rather unsympathetically, was it something like this, and waves a hand across his face, after which all his features disappear, and the entire area becomes dark. Now, there is a name for these faceless creatures. They are referred to as Nopero Bo, or Faceless Ghost, which are Japanese yokai that look like a human but have no face at all. They are primarily known for frightening humans, but are usually otherwise harmless. They will appear at first as ordinary people before causing their features to disappear. In at three, the witch's tree. On 6th Street and Park Ave in Louisville, Kentucky, you will find what can only be described as a natural monstrosity. A knotted tree, so misshapen and tortured that it could easily serve as a portal to hell. Now, even if the tree itself didn't catch your attention, the trinkets, baubles, and bead necklaces hanging from the branches certainly would. They are items that have been placed by the Louisville locals to appease the vengeful witches. To appease the vengeful witches. Now, the legend of the bizarre tree begins in the late 19th century, where it was supposedly the gathering place for a coven of witches, where they would perform their ceremonies. All was well until a city planning committee decided to remove the tree ahead of the annual May Day celebration. This, of course, displeased the witches greatly, so much so that they cast a curse. Exactly 11 months to the day after the tree was cut down, the city suffered a storm so severe 
It was assumed by locals that the witches had made good on their curse and summoned a storm demon. Now, during this horrendous storm, lightning struck the stump of the old witch's tree, and suddenly a new tree began to grow. However, it was not a healthy tree, but rather twisted and otherworldly. Now, whether these stories are true or not, the locals of Louisville believe this tree houses something dark and sinister, and to this day, continue to adorn it with baubles and trinkets. In it too, the headless woman of Iroquois. Park. Iroquois Park is a 739 acre park in Louisville, Kentucky, designed by Frederick Law Cherokee and Shawnee Parks. It is a serene and picturesque park with an old growth forest and viewpoint atop the hill. However, as you wander through the forest and the winding trails on a warm night, you may begin to hear the sound of a dog barking wildly. Following that, a thick fog will roll in, partially obstructing your vision. Then, you will smell the stench of smoke and fire begin to rise in the air. The fog will break, but just for a moment, and then you'll see a figure begin to approach. Now, accounts vary, but some state that a woman will appear dressed in early 1800 settlement clothes, and as she walks through the park, you can see her very clearly holding her head in her hands as blood drips from her severed neck. The legend has been passed down from generation to generation, with each new storyteller making it much more gruesome. For those looking for a thrill, it is said that the headless woman is regularly seen close to the lookout point, with some suspecting that she is the ghost of a farmer's wife who settled with her husband in the area where the park is now located. The story goes that one night while her husband was downtown on business, an Indian tribe attempted to sneak up on the homestead and ransack it. The intruders grabbed the woman and beheaded her before promptly setting fire to the home. Now, whether you believe this is that very same woman is up to you, but regardless, there have been far too many accounts of park goers seeing the headless woman for it to be simply legend. And finally, coming in at number one, the Pope Lick Monster. The Pope Lick Monster is said to be a part man, part goat, and part sheep creature reported to live beneath a railroad trestle bridge over Pope Lick Creek in the Fisherville neighborhood of Louisville, Kentucky. Now, numerous urban legends exist about the creature and its origins, with some accounts claiming that the creature uses hypnosis or voice mimicry to lure trespassers onto the trestle in order to kill them. However, other accounts claim that the creature jumps down from the trestle onto the roofs of cars passing beneath it. No matter what, the story, the creature is so unsettling to those who see it that they are driven to leap off of the trestle. Its origins vary, but some reports state that the human goat hybrid was a circus freak who vowed revenge after being mistreated. In another version, the monster escaped from a train that was derailed on the trestle. And the final rumor is that the creature is really the twisted reincarnated form of a farmer who sacrificed goats in exchange for satanic powers. No matter which way you spin it, this creature is horrifying and is said to be behind another number of deaths and accidents at the trestle since its initial construction, despite the now looming 8 foot fence built to keep thrill seekers out. Coming in at 5, Hairy Hands. The legend of Hairy Hands is infamous around the English moors of Devon, with this ghost story built up around a particular stretch of road in Dartmoor, which was purported to have an unusually high number of motor vehicle incidents during the last century. Now, between Cherry Brook and Postbridge in Devon, an isolated stretch of road named B3212 runs over the Leviathan folds of Dartmoor. Dartmoor, a wide open space that gives any traveller a claustrophobic sense of self while amongst the nature's in grand order. Along this stretch of road, there had been a high presence of driver, motorcyclists, and cyclists falling prey to dangerous collisions and accidents. However, this isn't what's baffling. It is instead their story and recounts of how and why their accidents occurred. On the 26th of August 1921, an army captain was driving across the moors when, according to him, a pair of invisible hands took a hold of him and forced his motorcycle off the road. This resulted in London newspapers picking up the story and making this supernatural occurrence famous nationwide. However, this wasn't the only occurrence. Many others have also experienced hands, but not always invisible ones. Some have even reported to be hairy hands, grabbing their steering wheels and attempting to steer the hapless traveller off the road. More interesting still, not all incidents have occurred in moving vehicles. In 1924, a woman camping on the mall with her husband reported seeing a hairy hand attempting to gain access to 
her caravan. However, she reported that the hand retreated after she made the sign of the Holy Cross. Now, the story of the hairy hands has grown over the years, with many attempting to write a backstory for the baffling road, with a few local versions attributing the hands to an unnamed man who died in an accident on B3212. Coming in at 4, Beast of Bodmin Moor. Also known as the Beast of Bodmin, this English urban legend first came to light back in 1978, after multiple people reported sightings of mutilated slain livestock and an alleged panther-like cat. Now, the sightings of the Beast of Bodmin Moor are the most famous alleged wildcat sightings across the whole of the UK. This legend baffled folks across Britain due to the fact that owning or importing big cats is illegal and often results in the animal getting detained or shot, sadly. Bodmin Moor is a creepy place, beast or not, and should you happen to find yourself wandering alone across the rugged landscape, it is hard for your mind not to dwell on the legend of the beast. The giant cat-like animal was supposedly 3 to 5 feet long and sporting white yellow eyes, and was reported enough for authorities to order an investigation into the beast and the mutilated livestock it left behind. However, the report concluded that there was no verifiable evidence of big cat on Bodmin Moor. However, there may be a logical reason for the reported sightings of the beast. It has been claimed that animal trainer Mary Chipperfield released three pumas into the wild following the closure of the Plymouth Zoo in 1978, and thus giving rise to the rumours of the beast. What do you guys think though? Big cat? Props. Coming in at number 3, Yotsuya Kaiden. Yotsuya Kaiden is a haunting story of Oiwa and Tamiya. Mia Lemon, and is about betrayal, murder, and ghostly revenge, making it one of Japan's and Tokyo's most famous ghost stories of all time. The legend itself is based loosely on two historical characters, with it depicting a woman, Oiwa, who is gradually poisoned by her husband due to the fact that she is having an extramarital affair. It is said that he presents the poison to her via face cream, which slowly eats away at her face, resulting in her having a lopsided and drooping appearance. Now, here's where the legend varies depending on which version of the story you are hearing. But it is said that Oiwa either accidentally cuts her throat and curses Tamiya's name while dying, or she is killed by Tamiya himself, or even dies of natural causes. Regardless of the cause of death, she comes back to haunt him when he marries the woman he had an affair with. It is also stated that when Tamiya weds his new wife, he lifts up the veil of his new bride, or his face appears instead. In shock and out of fear, he attacks her with his sword, halting the apparitions, but ultimately revealing that he has just killed his new bride. It is said that this may be based on two real life murders, ultimately combining fact and fiction. The first involved two servants who had murdered their respective masters. They were caught and executed on the same day. The second murder was from a samurai who discovered his concubine was having an affair with a servant. The samurai had the faithless concubine and servant nailed to a wooden board and thrown into the Kanda River. Coming in at number 2, Akamanto slash Red Cape. Akamanto or the Red Cape is a Japanese urban legend about a masked spirit who wears a red cloak and who is said to appear to people using toilets in public or school bathrooms. Accounts of course vary, but one consistent an element of the story is that the spirit will ask the person in the bathroom a question. In some versions, he will ask if they want red paper or blue paper, though other versions state a red cloak or a blue cloak or a red cape or a blue cape. Regardless of what it is, it is always blue or red, and regardless of the colour, no matter what option is selected, the person will always be killed. Specifically, if the person chooses the red option, they will be lacerated in such a manner that their body will be drenched in their own blood. Lovely. If the person chooses the blue option, the consequences range from that of the person being strangled to all of the person's blood being drained from their body. So what you must do is ignore the spirit, run away or reject both options in order to survive. However, if an individual attempts to outsmart Akamanto by asking for a different colour of cloak or cape, it is said that they will be dragged to an underworld or hell as a result. Author and folklorist Matthew Meyer has stated that the Akamanto has been recorded as a schoolyard rumour since the 1930s. Also more recently in the 2003 video game Castlevania Area of Sorrow, an enemy is featured known as Killer Mantle, which may have been based on the Akamanto legend. And finally coming in at number 1, the curse of Masakado. Taira no Masakado was a samurai in Japan who led one of the largest insurgent forces in the period against the central government of Kyoto. In 939, during the Heian period of Japanese history, Masakado led a minor rebellion which began when Masakado led an attack on the outpost of the central government in Hitachi province, capturing the governor. This resulted in Masakado becoming the new emperor. Over the centuries, Masakado became a demigod of sorts to the locals, with some even feeling the need to appear 
appease his malevolent spirit. Masakado ultimately met his end in a rather grisly manner, decapitated. His bodiless head oddly enough managed to be preserved remarkably well until it was eventually buried. Now his grave lies in Tokyo near the Otomachi subway station and it is said that removing or relocating it has been proven incredibly difficult, with many attempts resulting in those being plagued by misfortune. When the nearby Ministry of Finance tried to level the hill after 1923, 14 workers related to the project started dropping dead like flies from accidents or other bizarre incidents. It is said that the curse still exists to this day, with various stories of people becoming ill or dying after the shrine had been messed with. People have learned their lesson though and rarely touch it. It's even said that desks inside the buildings around the shrine are placed so as to not make anyone sit with their back to Masakado. Coming in at number 5, we have the Cannibal Babysitter. Like most great urban legends, this is a tale that has been adapted for many different audiences. Back before the inception of the internet, a similar tale was told of a babysitter who may have been drunk, may have been high, but definitely accidentally cooked a baby instead of a meal. Whoops. It plays on the classic parental fear of leaving your child with someone else. Sure, you'd like to put your trust in someone and have some time to yourself, but how do you really know what's happening if you're not there yourself? Imagine coming home to a sink full of greasy bones and a lunatic babysitter lounging on your couch. Yeah, those aren't chicken bones, are they? To modernize this tale, the World News Daily Report put out an article headlined, Missouri, Babysitter on Crystal Meth Eats 3-Month-Old Toddler. This is a masterpiece of a shareable article. Parents, people who hate addicts, people who watch horror movies, and Missourians all have a reason to be invested here. Is Missourians a real word? The article details a couple coming home after a night out to find their babysitter drunk and high, covered in blood. Not a good scene. They head to the kitchen and discover something even more terrifying. Their baby, in the microwave, covered in barbecue sauce. How anyone could read this and not think it's a joke is beyond me. But apparently it was effective enough to cause a small panic and spread to all sorts of places. Unfortunately for those who skim headlines, it was all a hoax. The World News Daily Report is a fake news site. Not quite parody, but definitely not to be taken seriously. They even put a little disclaimer at the bottom saying that they're not including any reality in their articles. Although I suppose people fooled by this don't often read all the way to the bottom though. Coming in at number 4, what's in my Red Bull? We all know that energy drinks are often under fire for including artificial stimulants. They'll rot your brain, teeth, gut, and hardwood flooring, or so I've been told. Remember that lady who had the whole science fair presentation on why monster energy drink is actually the mark of the devil? 666? Good times. Well, if you wanted to scare the crap out of vegans, cowboys, and generally anybody who doesn't want to unknowingly ingest reproductive fluids, you could tell them about this urban legend. Somehow, the rumor that Red Bull includes bull semen in their beverages took off. You see, Red Bull has taurine. This is an organic acid which is actually often found in infant milk formulas. If we dive a little deeper into this word, taurine, we'll find a couple of things. One, tor is a Greek or Latin root for bull. Still with me? The second half, ene, something derived from a bull, eh? Understandably, people thought of this and immediately came to the conclusion that taurine is something made by a bull, which is actually supported by the fact that it was originally isolated from ox bile, although these days we know that it's found in many more animals including humans. But back to the stuff made from bulls, people heard taurine and then saw that big red bull on the front of the can and thought, geez, what are they taking from bulls? This stuff that gives you energy? Makes you feel alive? Are the good folks at Red Bull feeding us vital essence from bulls? Eeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeee
Just try not to drink too much in celebration. Coming in at three, Jenny Green Tea. Occasionally referred to as Ginny Green Tea, this is an infamous figure in English folklore and is a river hack, not dissimilar to Peg Powell or Grindy Low. Jenny Green Teeth would reportedly pull children or the elderly into the water and drown them. This legend was popular in Lancashire and North Staffordshire, with many children describing this figure as green skinned with long hair and sharp teeth, and is also described as lurking in the upper branches of trees at night. Although folks are unsure if this is just the blurring of two popular legends, Jenny Greenteeth and Ginny Hewlett, a folk name for an owl. Now if you ask any Brit they won't tell you how or why this legend began, simply because they don't know. There is no particular story behind Ginny Greenteeth, yet that doesn't stop reports of scared children running from a woman in a swamp. However, many do consider her to be a memory of sacrificial practices, or perhaps even a form of social control, parents evoking fear into their children in order to steer them away from dangerous ponds, streams, rivers and canals. Coming in at 2, Black Shuck. Now this legend is perhaps the most common myth in Britain, specifically in the counties of East Anglia. Known as Black Shucks, Old Shuck, Old Shock, or simply even Shuck. These are all the names given to a ghostly looking black dog that is said to roam the coastline and countryside of East Anglia. Along the desolate coastal flats, among the graveyard, in the darkest forest, that is where the Black Shuck lurks. This calf sized malevolent hound with glowing red eyes is supposedly the harbinger of death, with it reportedly appearing during electrical storms, such as the one that struck the church is a Bungay and Blytheburg on the same day at the very same moment in August of 1577, leaving scorched claw marks on the church door. The incident resulted in two fatalities, with many reporting a feeling of dread. I quote, All down the church in the midst of fire, the hellish monster flew, and passing onward to the choir, he many people slew. Chills. D.A. Dutt wrote about the Black Shuck in his 1901 Highways and Byways in East Anglia book, stating, He takes the form of a huge black dog and proud along dark lanes and lonesome field footpaths, where, although his howling makes the hearer's blood run cold, his footfalls make no sound. You may know him at once, you should see him by his fiery eye. He has but one, and that, like the cyclops, is in the middle of his head. Now, I could go on, but I really don't think there's need, but where the black shuck, the harbinger of death and doom. And finally, coming in at number one, Big Grey Man from Ben MacDew. In Scottish folklore, the Big Grey Man, also known as the Big Grey Man of Ben MacDew, Dew is the name of the creature which is said to haunt the summit and passes of Ben MacDew, the second highest peak in Scotland and the British Isles. Perhaps the most enduring myth on our entire list, the Big Grey Man is described as being an extremely large Sasquatch like grey figure, covered in short hair, and wherever he ventures, he is said to be accompanied by a sense of irrational panic and dread. Evidence of the creature is limited to various sightings across Ben MacDew, as well as a few photographs and unusually large sized footprints, and almost all of the reports include the sound of footsteps crunching on the gravel just out of sight of the witness. Now, the first recorded sighting occurred in 1891, however, it wasn't made public until 1925. J. Norman Colley recounted their terrifying experience that they endured while summiting Ben McDew alone some 35 years prior, stating, I began to think I heard something else than merely the noise of my own footsteps. For every few steps I took, I heard a crunch, and then another crunch as if someone was walking after me but taking steps three or four times the length of my own. However, Collie isn't the only one to experience the strange footsteps, many other Ben McDew climbers have reported the same sounds, as well as the similar feelings of fear and panic. Now a few have summed this up as illusions, hallucinations even, natural stimulus brought on by exhaustion or isolation when climbing. What do you guys believe though? Ali. Located in Adelaide, Australia, a man known as Dr. Michael Schneider acquired the Clifton Manor in the early 1900s, a mansion located on the 40 acres of land in this picturesque landscape. Who wouldn't be happy? The doctor very quickly moved his wife and two daughters in, and for a brief time, everything was good. Schneider had a cabin on his land that he used to treat patients, however, rumour has it most of his patients were schizophrenic or mentally ill, and he decided to treat them on his secluded land to keep them away from his family. However, in a bizarre turn of events, his wife and two daughters all died due to an unforeseen accident. Schneider went mad, and the cabin was his place of torture, where he would work through his grief. However, it wasn't a healthy outlet, where Schneider using the cabin to perform surgeries with the 
without any form of anesthesia. Neighbours even reported hearing screams coming from the property, and rumours very quickly spread throughout the town that the doctor was killing and dismembering his patients as a form of satanic ritual. The cries continued, but no investigation was conducted until the doctor died. The police found Schneider in his home, with the limbs and bodies of his dead family surrounding him. It is now rumoured that the mansion is haunted by Dr. Schneider and his patients, and for those that enjoy fear, you can explore Schneider's Alley, which is now known as Andrew's Walk. But be warned. Coming in at 4, Bodies in the Bridge The Sydney Harbour Bridge is perhaps one of the most iconic landmarks in Sydney. It's a heritage listed steel through arch bridge that carries rail, vehicles, bicycles as well as pedestrian traffic between the business districts and the North Shore. However, this bridge houses an incredibly dark secret. It is widely known that the construction of the bridge took 8 years to build and resulted in deaths of up to 16 iron workers. These deaths have been recorded in the history books, however, it was not noted that there were actually far more deaths, with another three workers losing their lives with the government covering up and remaining hush hush about the entire thing. So why exactly did this happen? They were transparent about the 16 lives that were lost, but why not the other three? Well the story goes that the other three construction workers fell into the huge pylons while building was underway, and retrieving their bodies was deemed too difficult and costly, given that the workers were under immense pressure to complete the project. So rather than delay, they instead decided to leave the bodies embedded in the pylons where they supposedly remain to this day. If the myth is true, the Sydney Harbour Bridge is actually one giant burial site. Remember that next time you visit it. Coming in at number 3, we have HIV oranges. On the topic of unwanted bodily fluids in our foods and beverages, let's consider the curious case of the contaminated citrus. In February of 2015, somebody posted an image of sliced oranges on Facebook. The oranges had little bits of red coloration in them, and they were not blood oranges. Or were they? According to the poster, the oranges had come from Libya, and were seized in Algeria on the grounds that they had been injected with HIV positive blood. The post read, The immigration services of Algeria recovered a large quantity of these oranges coming from Libya. These oranges were injected with positive tested HIV and AIDS blood. Please share this message and warn people of D dangers involved. I mean, if the wording of that message doesn't convince you someone put their blood in oranges, I don't know what will. The image was found all over the place after that, with people either being really skeptical of the bloody fruit or having absolute freak out meltdowns. Regardless of the reaction, there's no real threat here. Firstly, it's obviously a hoax based on the baselessness of the claims and the lack of official language in the original post. Somebody just decided that oranges coming from Africa must have some sort of HIV risk involved, as weird xenophobic people tend to do. Secondly, there is no threat of HIV transfer either way. HIV can't be transferred via fruit. The rare cases where HIV has been transferred via foods happens when food is pre-chewed by an HIV-infected caregiver. And these oranges? Not pre-chewed. You can't get HIV from consuming food handled by an HIV-positive person. Even if it did contain small amounts of blood, which it likely doesn't, the virus would be destroyed by exposure to air, heat, or stomach acid. And who would put blood in an entire shipment's worth of oranges anyways? Coming in at number 2, we have Obamacare microchips. What a fun pairing of words, am I right? Back when Obamacare was first being introduced, people spread rumors that US residents would be required to be implanted with RFID microchips. Because, you know, Obama, I guess. But rumors of Big Brother wanting you riddled with tracking devices have been around since that kind of technology was first dreamed up. Folks are always worried that the government's going to tie them down and staple a blinking sensor into your spine or something. The Obamacare microchip legend began with some real documentation, though. However, there were two things wrong with the rumor. One, it was taken from an outdated piece of tabled legislation that never passed, and, and two, the legislation they were looking at was misread and misinterpreted. See, someone pulled the phrase, this sort of device be implanted in the majority of people who opt to become covered by the public health care option out of some health care legislation in 2010. This particular passage was used as damning evidence that Obama wanted to track every citizen come hell or high water. However, this sentence was from an earlier version of legislation that wasn't passed by Congress. And if you're worried that Congress attempted to pass some bills that mandated microchips for every American, fret not. It was actually referring to a healthcare registry that would allow the Department of Health and Human Services to collect data about medical devices like pacemakers and hip replacements. It was meant to help track effectiveness and facilitate the distribution of manufacturer recall notices. No microchips necessary. It makes sense that people are scared of having their every move tracked though. There's something ironic about that crowd sharing these theories on Facebook for iOS though. 
And finally at number one, Charlie Charlie. A sort of modernized Bloody Mary, Charlie Charlie was a spirit summoning game for the online era. In 2015, the Charlie Charlie Challenge blew up. Videos of kids putting two pencils on a piece of paper labeled yes and no were everywhere. Apparently, if done correctly, you could get a demon or ghost to answer simple questions. The origins of said demon or ghost varied widely depending on who you asked. Some said it was a Mexican spirit, and others said it was a child who was abused. Earlier tellings of the story seemed to favor the child, which in retrospect makes sense. What kind of Mexican ghost has the name Charlie? Carlos, maybe, but there's no Spanish history in the name Charles. Regardless of the ghost's backstory, it scared a whole lot of people. Most of the movement in the pencils could probably be attributed to gravity in the wind, or the nervous shaking and breathing of whoever set it up, but folks really thought there was a demon in their presence. To double down on the urban legenditude, it was also claimed that Charlie Charlie was a viral marketing scheme. People seem to think that the marketing team behind the movie The Gallows created the challenge to market their movie. Snopes stepped up and did some background research and found that early examples of the challenge predated the movie and its marketing. However, the idea that the Gallows co-opted the viral spook fest and used it smartly to promote their product isn't too far-fetched. Kicking us off at number 5, we've got the Red Room Curse. If you're familiar with the dark web, or maybe even some Cronenbergian techno fetishes, you might assume that Red Room means murder broadcast, and technically, you're correct. But there's more than one Red Room out there, and the one we'll discuss today is a little less voyeuristic. Just as online, though. The Red Room is an internet legend about a cursed pop-up that would appear from time to time on people's computers. It would show a door and ask, do you like the Red Room? Now you can answer yes or no or maybe, but the result is gonna be the same. People who have come across the pop-up are invariably found dead. Their room becomes the Red Room, with the walls covered in their blood. Shortly after the legend gained traction, a flash animation of a boy cursed by the pop-up showed up. It was quite popular at the time. In fact, it linked a real-life murder to the Red Room curse. The schoolgirl that committed the Sasebo slashing in 2004 was found to be a fan of the flash animation. The 11-year-old student killed her classmate with a utility knife, slashing her throat and arms. When questioned by police, she admitted to the crime and said that she had been bullied online. The girl she killed had called her a goody-goody and made mean comments about her weight. In addition to bookmarking the Red Room animation, it's also worth noting that the killer had read and watched Battle Royale, where school-age students fight to the death. Now, links between violent media and violence are always weak at best, but this is quite the interesting development. I knew pop-ups were annoying, but to lead to something like this? Sheesh. Coming in at number four, we've got the Kunai Kunai. While researching this, I also found that Kunai Kunai is a very cute breed of pig. No relation. But if you get scared, maybe consider taking a look at a picture of a pig or two to take your mind off the spooks. The Japanese urban legend Kune Kune is a lot less cute. In fact, try to look too close and you'll really regret it. The myth originated online around 2003 with people giving first-hand accounts of seeing this being. These reports were not unlike early accounts of Slender Man with folks claiming to have seen or photographed something strange with bad things happening afterwards. Kune Kune translates roughly to wriggling body, which is exactly what it does. It's a slender humanoid made of white paper or fabric that appears in fields on hot summer days around lunchtime. It's been seen on wide open rice fields most often, and sometimes even over open water. If there is a great expanse, you might see kunai kunai off in the distance. This thing wiggles its limbs about endlessly, as if it's being constantly blown by wind, even when there is none. It can only be seen from a distance. Interestingly enough though, people that seem to be right beside it don't tend to notice its presence. People have reported seeing workers on fields go about their business without so much as a passing glance at the thing. If you do see one from far away, do not try to get any closer. Looking too closely at a kunai kunai can cause you to go insane, and if you try to get close enough to touch one, it might kill you. Keeping your distance and not attempting contact is the best strategy here. It ignores people who offer it the same amount of disregard. Now, because of all the details concerning distance and lack of close-up confrontation, many skeptics claim that kunai kunai is just people's overacting imaginations, misinterpreting maybe a scarecrow or a wick drain. But you will not find me hurtling through rice fields to find out. Coming in at three, the Satanists of Perth. This may come as a shock to some Australians, but according to many rumours, Perth is home to a thriving community of Satanic worshippers. Yeah. 
fun times. According to reports and speculation, these worshippers come together at King's Park in the dead of night to perform these devilish rituals, with the group drawing strange symbols, burning figures, as well as having wild, non stop orgies on the grassy slopes of the mound. And of course, once a year, the coven come together and perform a human sacrifice. According to some theorists, the group does this by hunting down and murdering the local homeless as a means to sustain their power with the devil. Coming in at 2, Sydney's subterranean world. Locked away deep under the hustle and bustle of Sydney's major train station lies a network of train platforms, tunnels and tracks that were built in the 1920s but were never operational. This was to be one of the first underground stations in Australia, however the plan to continue work on additional lines was cancelled when the Great Depression struck. The labyrinth of tunnels extends 1 kilometer in 2 directions, from St James Station about 30 metres below Hyde Park and past the Cahill Expressway entrance off McCary Street. Now these tunnels lay unused under the streets of Sydney which has over time led to some downright creepy rumours and speculation. A few urban legends have arisen including that of an albino eel that is said to reside in the St James Tunnel Lake, as well as that the underground level was built by marauding first settlers to aid them in their kidnapping schemes. Now many urban explorers have gone deep into the tunnels taking disturbing and unsettling pictures that they've shared online. In one explorer's picture they captured an unsettling picture of Satan with a skeleton cross and a heart on fire, with them stating that it represents hell. Spooky. Would you dare explore this subterranean world? I wouldn't. And finally, coming in at number one, the Burning Airman. Back in 1940, a horrible tragedy struck Canberra when a Lockheed Hudson bomber plane lost control and crashed into the woods. The event was a bizarre occurrence considering it was a sunny and clear day with the plane coming in to land from a normal flight, before suddenly just nose diving into a field and bursting into flames. It was a terrible incident that was ultimately dubbed Canberra Air Disaster and went down as one of the most tragic events in Australian history. However, it didn't end there. Years later, reports began to come in from local residents who had strange encounters in the woods, with many of them claiming they saw odd lights near the crash site, and many others claiming that they heard the distant drone of an airplane, followed by a loud bang. However, the most terrifying of them all was a local teenage girl who emerged one night from the woods in a fit of terror, claiming that she had been chased by the dead airman whose spectral body was covered in flames. What was previously a popular makeout spot for kids is now closed, and instead houses a memorial site for the deceased airman. Man. Coming in at 5, Huldra, also known as Hulda. These are seductive forest creatures found in Scandinavian folklore. Huldra derives from a root meaning covered or secret and is often depicted as just one individual, however through folklore it has changed to an entire Hulda race and not just one single entity. Hulda is described as being a troll like woman living in the woods and is known to be fair and beautiful, but wild and is known to have long hair which she hides behind her back upon meeting a human. This legend goes that Adam and Eve Eve had a handful of children and one day when Eve was giving her children a bath, God came to visit her. However, Eve had not yet bathed all her children, so she hid the ones that were dirty. God asked her, are there not more children? Eve said no. So God responded, then let all that is hidden remain hidden. And thus the ones hidden became to under Duriski, excuse my pronunciation please, which means the ones living underground. The hidden children became lost souls under the surface of the earth, calling for someone to be with them, usually human passerbys. Holder was one of these children, yet somehow managed to remain on the surface of the earth. Be warned, she is neither good nor evil and cannot be trusted. Coming in at 4, Jotni, also known as Jutun or Jutna. This legend is described as being a type of entity contrasted with gods and other figures such as dwarfs and elves. In Norse mythology, Jotni appears as a giant being, often ugly and lumpy with many of them in possession of great knowledge. Oftentimes the Jotney is described as riding on a wolf with vipers as reins and is believed to be depicted in this 10th century picture stone from the Hunnestad monument. As I previously stated, most Jotney possess great wisdom, for example Vavtrudni, I don't know how to pronounce it, who was clad with the very same knowledge as Odin. Legend goes that the Jotni are Thor's most dangerous opponent and is a major motif in Norse mythology, with the Jotni residing in the great mountain area of southern Norway. Now throughout history the folklore has become blurred, with some stories blending Jotni and trolls together into one, but that is simply not the case, with these two legends having very separate histories throughout folklore. And that's the tea. 
Coming in at number three, we've got Tomino's Hell. You've likely heard of Dante's Inferno, which while often quite disturbing, doesn't come with a curse attached. Tomino's Hell does. This poem by Saijo Yasso depicts a young boy descending into hell for unnamed crimes. Sweet Tomino is going to Jigoku, the Buddhist hell. Speaking of Jigoku, if you haven't seen the flick of the same name by Nobuo Nakagawa, drop what you're doing and watch it right now. Not only is it a fantastic visual marvel of a movie, it'll also make the story much scarier through its depiction of Buddhist hell. It's never explicitly stated in the poem, but it appears as if Tomino is heading down for killing his family. Apparently, if you read this poem out loud, you'll be cursed. Misfortune and death will follow anyone who decides to recite it. Back when this tale was first circulated, there are plenty of folks who would post on 2chan claiming that they were going to try. Photos, videos, and sound clips of people reading the poem were posted. Many said that nothing happened to them, but some others never returned after saying the cursed words aloud. The poem itself isn't very long, so I considered reading it aloud for everyone out there, but kind of like not being cursed, so maybe I'll wait for a day when I feel more open to eternal torment. Feel free to try yourself though. Coming in at number two, we've got Kuchisaki Ona. It's hard to come up with a Japanese urban legend more popular than the slip-mouthed woman. She's on every list, featured in every article, plastered on the front of all sorts of movies, manga, and anime. This is an urban legend with staying power. The story goes that late at night, a woman wearing a surgical mask will approach lone travelers. Oftentimes, these solitary strollers will be children. She'll ask them, am I beautiful? And if you answer no, you're cooked. She'll pull out a pair of gnarly scissors and kill you on the spot, so be nice. If you answer yes, she'll remove her mask, revealing a gruesome, grotesque grin. Her mouth has been lengthened, and what I mean by this is that her face is slit from ear to ear. Then she'll ask you the question again. If you answer no, well, you're still cooked, you die. But if you give her a positive answer, you're not much better off this time. Kuchisake Ona is so relieved that someone thinks she's beautiful, she'll want you to join in on the fun. The scissors come out and she'll give you a smile just like hers. Now you're twins. If you'd rather keep your life and your facial structure, you can try to confuse her. By answering with wishy-washy statements, you might find a window with which to escape. Some say that answering her questions with more questions can also result in confusion. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, how did she end up with that slit mouth? It's been said that she was an adulterous wife and her husband caught her cheating. In a rage, he cut her mouth asking, who will think you're beautiful now? Yikes. The surgical mask has always been a popular accessory in Japan as it's considered good manners to wear one when you're sick. Now that masks are everywhere as a result of the current pandemic, do you think Kuchisaka Ono will be making some appearances elsewhere? And finally at number one, we've got Akamanto. This one scares me because of where it tends to happen. See, Akamanto, or Red Cloak, is a masked spirit who appears before folks using public restrooms. I like my privacy, thank you very much. There are many different variations on this legend, but usually the spirit will appear in a red cloak and ask someone on the toilet a question. Red toilet paper? or blue, just like the Matrix. However, there's less actual choice here. Pick either one and you'll end up the same. Choose red and you'll die a bloody death. Choose blue and you'll suffocate to death, turning blue. Even if you decide you'd rather use plain old white toilet paper, you'll be pulled to hell by a ghastly apparition. There is no winning here, or is there? Apparently, you can leave the loo with your life if you politely refuse both options or if you ignore the toilet ghost outright. I mean, that's probably what I would do in the first place. Nobody needs some weirdo offering them premium TP when they're using the public bathroom. I accepted my one-ply fate when I came in here. You can also just run away without wiping, but come on, we've got standards, don't we? Apparently this myth dates all the way back to the 1930s. This toilet paper ghost has longevity. From open fields to public washrooms, nowhere seems to be safe, eh? Oh, well, it does seem that if you just ignore the ghosts, you're not in trouble. Some folks can't help it though, can they? How else would horror movies get made? Number five on this list is Stull's Gateway to Hell. Anything named Stull was just doomed from the start, guys. Thrillist says the tiny town of Stull has counted very few residents since it was founded in 1856. The most famous is rumored to be Lucifer himself, who some say appears at the town cemetery on Halloween and Spring Eve. Equinox. They say he uses the site where a roofless church once stood as a portal to and from hell. Some say that he's drawn to the site of frequent witch hangings. Others believe one of the graves actually contains Satan's own child. Either way, new graves continue to be dug despite signs warning against trespassers, perhaps referring directly to the Prince of Darkness himself or the cults that are rumored to flock to the grounds. The first published article about the horrors are traced back to a 1974 article in the University Daily Kansan, though 
though whispers about evil have persisted since 1900 or so. In 1998, the hanging tree was torn down to stop people from visiting. It hasn't lessened the need for a small town to bolster an annual police presence to deter visitors looking for a glimpse of the devil himself. So we have witch hangings here, we have cults that flock here, and then we also have the worst thing of all, the literal devil potentially calling this place home. How could somebody decide to name a town Stull? That is way too close to the word skull and it's just destined for failure. People have been smart enough not to live here all that much and as Thrillist has said, the residents are few and far between, but it doesn't change the fact that this place is deeply haunted. If the devil truly does live here and there is a portal to hell, then there's no telling what other crazy things can happen here. Maybe there are a few residents around because the devil has been taking them. I also think it's interesting that there are more police around this place. Why would there be a bunch of police around an area where there isn't that many people? Maybe the government knows something about this place that we don't. Maybe they're hiding something and don't want locals finding out. It's just a theory, but based on the rumors around this place, I could believe it. Number four on this list is the devil's chair. I am perfectly happy with my lazy boy and don't need to be sitting on any type of devil's chair anytime soon. Insider says, the legend of the devil's chair goes like this. An old farmer in Alma refused to sell his land to the city in order to build a new cemetery. Someone got a little too tired of waiting for him to sell, so he was pushed into his own well. Eventually, somebody said that there was a terrible smell coming from the well, so the city sent someone to investigate. It was ruled that the well was empty and it was boarded up. Now, if you make your way to Alma, you can actually sit on the boarded up well, but legend says that people who have sat on the well have been known to mysteriously disappear. Where the heck did my dude go? He was down there in the well and then just poof, he was gone. Like did his body go underwater and just couldn't be seen or was there something more paranormal afoot? Well, whatever happened to the body, I guess it doesn't matter too much now because there is certainly something paranormal happening here today. If you sit on this chair, you will literally go missing. Yeah, maybe let's stop sitting on the haunted well that people have named the devil's chair. Maybe, oh, I don't know, let's put a fence around it or Better yet, let's just destroy the damn thing. Coming in at three, Fossa Grimmen, simply known as Grim. This is a water spirit or troll in Scandinavian folklore. This water spirit plays the fiddle and is described as being exceptionally talented with the sounds of forest, wind, and water playing over his fiddle strings. He is a young, handsome man who sits naked under waterfalls. What's not to love? Playing mostly the music of nature, Grim is said to be willing to teach his fiddle skills in exchange for a food offering made on a Thursday evening. And in secrecy. The offerings he accepts is a white goat throne with head turned away into a waterfall that flows northwards, smoked mutton stolen from the neighbor's storage four Thursdays in a row. However, if there is not enough meat on the bone, he will only teach those seeking the skill how to tune the fiddle. What a dick. However, if the offering is satisfactory, he'll take the student's right hand and draw the fingers along the strings until they all bleed. But after that time, the student will be able to play so well that, I quote, the trees shall dance and torrents in their fall stand still. It is rumored that Torgir Organsson, better known as Milligutten, was a famous fiddle player from Telemark, Norway, who was so good at the fiddle that he was believed to have sold his soul in exchange for Grimm's skills. Coming in at two, Nokken. Nokken is the Norwegian name for a specific type of water spirit also known as the Nak or the Nika. The Nokken are supposedly able to shapeshift but are more commonly known as male water spirits who lure women and children to their deaths usually using their enchanted violin. This most commonly occurs at Christmas or on Midsummer's Eve with the Nokken targeting pregnant women or children that had yet to be baptized. Now it's not easy to describe the appearance of the Nokken due to its tendency to shapeshift however reports have stated that he is a rather elegant man oftentimes lurking inside the waterfall. Seems to be where all the hot men are lurking these days. However, sometimes he has been depicted as a brook horse. Be warned, the Nokken will become unhappy if he does not have access to water, with tales emerging of one spirit who went to live with a human after they had fallen in love, but was unable to stay due to their deep yearning to be by the water. So if you ever find yourself lured in by the Nokken, just drain that waterfall and run away. Easy enough, right? However, don't fret too much with most crediting this legend as a manifestation of the dangers associated with water. And finally, Coming in at number one, 
trolls. I mean of course trolls are the primary legend in all of Scandinavian mythology and folklore. Old Norse history describes trolls as beings that dwell in isolated rocks, mountains or caves and lives together in small family units that are rarely useful to human beings. Now trolls are said to be inspired by the cruel giants who were the primary enemies of the gods who lived in the mountains of Utgard. They are said to have human like appearance but they are incredibly big and ugly. No shame just facts. Now like all legends it varies from source to source with some trolls being dim witted, some have no particular grotesque characteristics to others being dangerous to human beings. Now although some are described as being man eaters and as turning to stone upon contact with the sun, trolls are also attested as being solitary beings living far away from civilization. Upon the arrival of Christianity around the 1300s the stories began to change, with stories emerging of the trolls being able to smell the blood of a Christian man, with them basically representing anything of the old times, which the new religion condemned. Thank you.